Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grillin' JR with the voice of wrestling. Good old JR. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Connie. Good to hear your voice. It's good to uh, appreciate all the folks that are tuning in and joining us. We appreciate your business, everybody. We're very, very grateful to you for helping the, making our, our podcast so successful. I'm uh, very proud of what we're Conrad and our building and uh, we could not do it without you to say the very least. We are so excited to be back with you. We're talking about one of the more controversial moments from 18 years ago when stone cold walked out on WWE. We'll get into it in long form, but before we do, I feel like at the top of the show, we should just play a little catch up. You, uh, just returned from Jacksonville, Florida. You'd been sort of relocated for the better part of a month. And, uh, you guys had one heck of a pay-per-view and, uh, Mike Tyson was involved in the pay-per-view and then the taping or the, the live show after, and there's just a lot of moving and shaking in your professional world these days, man. Yeah. It's been fun, Conrad. You know, the Mike Tyson thing is uh, Mike's a, a lot, uh, very polarizing. You know, he, he, he garners publicity. I think that's why anybody, you know, when, 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 when we used W, uh, in WWE back in the day, when Tyson was there and did the thing with Austin and, and Sean and all that stuff, uh, you know, Mike got the company a great deal of publicity because everybody, he's a, like I said, he's polarizing. He's a lightning rod and people are still interested in what he does. Uh, so the, the, I will say this, there was some controversy in the show a few weeks ago where, uh, he came out to confront, he meaning Tyson came out to confront Chris Jericho and he had with him, uh, four MMA legends and we didn't mention them. Uh, we mentioned, uh, Henry Cenudo and we mentioned, uh, of course, Mike was a focal point. He's not an MMA guy. We've mentioned Mike, but, uh, uh, golly, the other, the other fellows that were there, uh, Rashad Evans, uh, we didn't, he was not mentioned because we didn't know he was a part of the entourage. Uh, you know, Vitor Belfort, same deal. They, they were in a mass group and they were, they were, they were kind of camouflaged. But the main thing about that, even I heard Melser talk about it, all these guys talk about it, was the fact that we didn't mention them and we, you know, we, we basically no sold them. Well, it wasn't our intent to no sell anybody. Right. Our the intent was to get everybody over, but no one told me Excalibur or uh, Tony that uh, who all was in the entourage, and so consequently we didn't know who was there. We, it was all about Tyson. I, I talked to, you know, I saw Henry Sanudo earlier in the day. I didn't even see Rashad Evans earlier in the day. I didn't see Vitor Belfort earlier in the day and nobody told us that they were there. Right. And so then I asked, you know, after the fact, when I was, I was kind of pissed to be honest with you, you know, we should have done a better job with that. All of us. And, uh, that was just a breakdown in communication is growing pains. Uh, so, you know, it's not a, the end of the world, but. Uh, I felt badly for those guys because if they watched it back, they said, oh, hell, we didn't even get mentioned. And you know, they were there to get it on television. So to kind of jumpstart or create an opportunity or whatever it may be, but I felt badly about that, uh, that we didn't do our jobs as the three announced guys, but we didn't know. 
we didn't know who they, you know, Rashad had a new hairstyle. He didn't look like he used to look, uh, Vitor Belfort's a pretty, uh, you know, he's a kind of a average looking dude, you know, so they didn't, none of them, none of them st- stood out in that respect. So I felt badly about that. So that was a little bit of a headline of that, that week. And you know, why did they do this? And why, why didn't the announcer say anything about it? Well, there's a reason we weren't aware they were in that, co- that group of people. And, uh, so I felt badly about that Conrad, but it was interesting, you know, it, ironically, uh, I read where the battle Royal that night got over a million viewers and that's pretty good for us. So, uh, and you know, I know that the ratings have been good with in our demo, 18 to 34 demo, we beat, we have more 18 and 34s than let's say, for example, Monday night raw has had in major markets like New York city and all other, other clubs on the East coast, Philly, places like that, I'm told that, uh, you know, so the ratings have been, we're growing people are, you know, we're trying to do our best in this empty arena environment, but I think, uh, putting our talents that are there that have been uh, brought in to do other things like dark things of that nature of uh, being at ringside has always helped us. And now they're kind of getting to the hang of it. Uh, you know, that daily place is so big that you can have a few fans, friends, fam. I think the last week we had, I think it was last week, but nonetheless, we had some, uh, there was some, uh, national guard people, guys staying at the, uh, Hyatt there in Jacksonville and they were invited to come. So they, they had all been, everybody was there has been tested. So we we're all good there, but, uh, we're trying to work around all the rules and regulations and see how that works since in, in the month of May, as you mentioned, I was there almost the entire month of May staying in a little community, Neptune beach. I enjoyed it greatly. Still got, a, I got an Airbnb there, uh, for, for June and July. And, uh, but it was, uh, it was just a really a good, uh, time to be there. And I really like uh, the, the community, you know, I, co- I had a, I had an afternoon where I spent, uh, three hours or so with head coach, uh, the Jags, uh, Doug Marone and he came over to my place and we had a beer or two and talked a little football. And he's a major, major legit wrestling fan. So, uh, I, I've enjoyed my relationships there meeting, new, making new friends and I'll, uh, entertain you the next time you come down that area too. So it's going to be good. So it's a good, it's been a good month, a lot of work done. Uh, you know, the show we had, uh, last night was strong. I thought, I thought actually the show we had last night was a better TV show than the Tyson episode. The wrestling on it was uh, really, really strong. And, you know, Cody and, uh, jungle boy had a, had a great outing. I thought uh, to close the show and really, really good. The tag team title match was strong, you know, uh, Jericho and, uh, Colt Cabana had a really good old school, like pro wrestling presentation. So we're, 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 we're doing well. And our young guys are starting to, you know, they're getting the feel of it. They're getting to understand how to do national television, TV matches. And it's a whole different ball game than doing a, a live event, i.e. a house show, uh, or, or something along those lines. So it's a, it's been fun, man. It's been fun. And I'm blessed to be a part of it. And, you know, Tony Khan's taking great care of me and I, and I appreciate it. So I'm going to take great care of him as best I possibly can. So it's, it's good, man. It's, it's been a good month. And again, uh, good to be back here on uh, grilling JR and hopefully the fans are going to enjoy today's show. You know, I've had a busy week on, we were not talking before we were on the air about our football tickets, yours to Alabama and mine in Oklahoma. And as we're recording this, I'm renewing my tickets today. Just kind of waiting to see if the, we're going to have a season. Yeah, well, I didn't know for sure. Right. So anyway, we know that's coming back. So it's, it's all good. Uh, I, yes, uh, Sunday, this past Sunday, I signed about 250, uh, under the black cat books, uh, that our website, jrsbbq.com. So that offer still good folks, uh, personalized autograph. I'll, I'll write what you need, what you want. You request it. I can do it. I pay for the shipping for lower 48 and it's the first edition hardcover book. So uh, it's a good value. JRSBVQ.com plus, uh, man, I gotta do this too. I gotta get you some sauce. Uh, we're selling a lot of barbecue sauce. The original sauce is going crazy. Uh, we're going through several cases a week, people ordering it for the grilling season. So I'm staying busy. You know, my dad says, son, you're busier than a fruit merchant. You know what the, <laughs> what the origins of that is a fruit merchant. Here's the deal about a fruit merchant. A fruit merchant has got to stay busy because he's selling perishable goods. Right. 
So on the, on the intersection, you're, you're setting up your shop. For example, if you got any business, fruit merchants got to move to another intersection. He's got to move to where the traffic is to sell his perishable goods. So, uh, I am busier than a fruit merchant, but I'm, I wouldn't trade it for anything. So it's all good. Life is good. I'm happy and I'm healthy. And I think I, I might've missed this already, but I, I think I was tested at least four times. I can recall in the month of May for the, for the virus. And that's kind of how we're working it. You know, everybody that passes through those gates at Daly's place is clean. They got, they've got their tests. They've had blood work done. They've had their temperature taken. And every time we go through those gates, our temperature is taken. Everybody, all the crew, the wrestlers, the, all the talent, everybody. So it's, uh, I, they, we got a system down and, you know, uh, through the great, you know, we got a good staff, we got a good staff there and they're, they're keenly aware of what's going on. So, uh, it's all good. I'm going to be down there in Jacksonville for a lot of the month of June. And, and, uh, and of course in July is a very busy week because we've got, I think we have three or four Wednesdays in July. I think it's four or five. I'm not sure, but nonetheless, it's going to be a busy month. So life is good, buddy. I mean, you're blessed, blessed big boys. Five Wednesdays in July, going to be a lot of Jr. on TV. We hope you guys have enjoyed all the Jr. in your ear. You've been getting all these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. And we should mention you and Tony have been doing something kind of fun. We're calling it on the road again. We set up Tony's uh, rental vehicle with a couple of cameras and. You guys got to shoot the shit as you went up and down the road on your way to Jacksonville and then on your way home, uh, to Atlanta. And I think there was some pretty good stuff that came out of that, that fans are really digging over at adfreeshows.com. And it's so much fun, Conrad, you know, we have no script. We have no producer. We have nobody in our ear. It's just two guys that are friends that are, that are pro wrestling lifers. Just tell them whatever story pops in our head and one story leads to another and you know, uh, and I love traveling with Tony and this, it takes me back to the eighties. That's when we first started traveling together. You know, when I worked, when I went to work for Jim Crockett promotions after the UWS, uh, uh, buyout, Tony and I've been friends all those years. And, and, uh, then there was a time where, you know, we were roommates, we travel together, you know, when you're making $35 a day per diem, all in room, car, food, 35 bucks. It's smart to combine your 35 and make it 70 so that you can, you know, share that room with the brand new, uh, Fairfield Inn at the airport. Oh my gosh. Uh, oh yeah, man. And we, we shared a room and Tony get up at like four in the morning and do a sports cast in, uh, Charlotte, which I always thought was amazing how he, he, he could pull that off. And he did, he did a real good job with it. So and then we could, we could share our, the food budget, you know, we'd, you know, we were bad boys going to those, uh, all you can eat places. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all good, man. So I, I, I've gotten a good feedback on Twitter at J R S B B Q, uh, regarding, uh, fans that have watched uh, our, our, our road trips. They seem to really like them. You know, they're irreverent. They're half ass funny. Uh, there's some serious stuff there. There's, you know, good wrestling talk behind the scenes stuff and things of that nature. So if you're not a client, a customer or user of the, our ad free shows, folks, you're missing not only that, but you're missing a lot of other stuff from some really talented guys, uh, on Tom Conrad's roster, you know, Eric and, and Aaron, and Tony, myself and Bruce. Uh, so it's, it's good stuff and I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it. So having fun, man, this whole, uh, it's funny how this, this, uh, this, COVID thing is, has, has changed our life. And I think it will continue to change our life. I'm not sure Conrad that, that we'll ever go back to exactly how it used to be. I think there's going to be checks and balances in place, uh, just to ensure that you're, we're doing the right thing, being smart. Then of course you got the, the issues now with, uh, these, uh, these rioting folks and I, you know, black lives do matter, man, you know, and you know, people say, that, how do you, how, is that you have a hard time saying that, you know, Conrad's from Alabama, Jr. you're from Oklahoma. Are you really sure black lives matter? You're goddamn right. I'm sure they matter. Yeah. I'm sure that every life matters. And, but especially, uh, the black lives matter because they continually, they meaning the, the African Americans continually get the short end of the stick. And somewhere along the way, we got to change this stuff, man. We can't raise your kids in this kind of world, this kind of atmosphere. You can't, what kind of, what's the next generation going to be like? What are the, what, what's their learned behavior going to be? 
So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of Black Lives Matter, and I'm, and I've got so many friends of all ethnicities, all persuasions. You know, I got I got my shit, and, and some some uh, idiots uh, that I call because they didn't understand the whole story, but they have to have cause. You know, I called a uh, Sunny Kiss on the show a she. That was a fraudulence. That was just an error. That's on my part. I wasn't premeditated, but if you're around Sonny Kiss, you know he's a very talented person, uh, very very uh, effeminate to, to a lot of people, and so I got in a heat of battle and called him or her, and then of course that got to all kinds of shit storm. Well, you know, that, what's uh, weird about that too? I just I don't mean to cut you off, but Sonny has been very upfront about this and even tweeted. I mean, in fact, his, uh, his social media account, his Twitter account itself says college wrestler, AEW, New Jersey, college, babe, believer, she slash he. So non-issue, at least as far as I'm concerned. Me too. I really did. And after the show was over, <clears throat> pardon me, I was looking at the, uh, Twitter feed and I do that every, after every show to see what the response is and what you like, what you didn't like, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, I. I said, hey, look, I made a mistake out there, Sonny. I, I, I made an error, but it, but it wasn't intentional. And it certainly was. I said, you know, the resp respect I have for you. And you know that we, you and I like each other. We've had great conversations because all Sonny Kiss wants to do is be a pro successful professional wrestler. Right. And, uh, so he said uh, to me that, you know, you've been one of the nicest people here to me. Uh, you've always taken time to talk to me. You give me advice. You give me feedback when I ask for it or when I don't sometimes he said, but I identify with he's or she's well, there you go. And so I'm fine with it. So don't worry about what they're saying because it didn't bother me one iota, but for some that have to have a cause they, I think some of these bastards have to have a probably need a step ladder to get on a soapbox. They're so damn small and in their, in their, in their world that th this is the trend. Neg you know, look at the, I, I've seen, <clears throat> I've seen so many writing, uh, videos. I get it, but how much do I need to be fed that? Do I need a three or four minute feature on people breaking windows? I get it. They're black. People are pissed off. They've been wrong again and again and again, but you know, that's just the nature of our, uh, our media force feed overfeed. And you know, God damn it. You're going to like this or, or I'm going to kill you. Or if it, even if it kills you, you're going to like it. So, uh, so anyway, Sonny was a, Sonny's a good dude. And, uh, you know, he's got a, he's got an interesting hand to play. He's a lot more talented than people perceive because of the prejudices because a he's black and B, uh, he's living an alternate lifestyle. So, you know, I guess the next uh, topic would be Nyla Rose transgender woman. She lives her life as a woman. Why should I care? What does it matter? It doesn't matter. As long as that Nyla is happy and healthy, enjoying her life. Because Conrad, you know, I can tell you, you know, I'll use this as an example a long time. That day I went to record a podcast, which by the way, is on ad free shows, all my old shows. And I'm driving home. The last call I expected to get was from the Norman police telling me your wife's been involved in an accident. And you need to get to the OU medical center as fast as you can. Tomorrow's are not guaranteed Conrad. So I I'm, I'm living my life that way, man. These guys are happy and they're, and they're enjoying us. The guys, that's just the slang, but if these people are happy, why shouldn't I be happy for them? Right. Doesn't make any sense, man. So anyway, uh, we, we pontificated on that enough. We can get to our business at hand, but I'm glad to catch up with you. And you know, we've been. We've been, we've been, uh, shifts in the night here. So it's, it's good to talk to you and it's good to, to be able to express myself, uh, to the fans and clear up some of these issues, uh, and move on. So, but life is good. I'm healthy and I'm happy and my family's healthy and they're happy. So you know, that's, that's kind of the main thing for me. I'm, I'm good and I'm good and, and we're good. Unfortunately, we have to talk about some less than happy times. We're talking about. Steve Austin walking out on WWE happened in 2002. His last match on raw was June 3rd, 2002. So yesterday was the 18 year anniversary. I suppose there's been a lot of, um, talk about this move over the years. I think Austin has pointed to this particular decision as being his biggest regret. I think he told sports illustrated a few years ago that 
this was the biggest regret of his career. And there's a lot going on. I mean, I guess to sort of give you the backstory, he is the biggest star uh, ever in the company at this point, but it didn't start that way. He came in in 95 as the ringmaster. Fast forward a year later, and he's no longer with Ted DiBiase and carrying the million dollar belt. Now it's uh, Austin 316. He wins the uh, King of the Ring tournament. Uh, allegedly, that was supposed to be Hunter Hearst Helmsley's spot, but the whole curtain call thing happens. They pivot. Stone Cold has an opportunity, and he makes the most of it after he wins King of the Ring. Uh, he says that famous Austin 316 line the next week at TV, the signs are everywhere. It becomes the hottest selling t-shirt and they're off to the races. Uh, he would, uh, of course, get a run with the intercontinental title. Then fast forward in 98, he becomes the world champion. And a little bit after WrestleMania 14, we see the Mr. McMahon character go toe to toe with stone cold on raw. And it's the first time that raw beats nitro. And it hasn't happened that way in a long, long time. 83 weeks, the streak ends right there. And the rest of the time, man, they're off to the races, setting one record after another along the way. Of course, we've covered it before. Austin had his neck injury and he sidelined in 2000. Uh, They set all kinds of records in 2001 at the Astrodome. But at the end of that show, they make what's probably Steve Austin's second biggest regret. He turns heel and the business never quite recovers. And I think if you had to go back in time, Jim and trace when some of Steve's unhappiness with creative and maybe the seeds of him walking out in June of 2002 happened, you got to go back to WrestleMania 17 the year prior. Do you not? Yeah. It's a pivotal time for all of us. Certainly a crucial time for Steve. When you take your biggest baby face who was more over than in anybody in WWE history. I, I, I will, I will firmly debate anybody and I'm not knocking guys, all the great baby faces that, uh, that McMahon promoted there at Hogan. And I'm not knocking Hulk at all. It was a different, it's a different character, a different generation. Austin conformed with the times and the times were much like we're living now, very defiant, uh, and very combative. So, uh, that was a, that was a key, that was a key moment. Uh, you know, I've, I've compared it to John Wayne. I always looked at Steve kind of as the, uh, John Wayne of the WWE, you know, uh, he stood on his principles. He stood on his ground, he stood his ground, whether it be popular or not, just like John Wayne did in real life with his, uh, political, uh, views, a uh, big time Republican was John Wayne. And he was very active in the party, which a lot of actors would stay away from because they didn't want to inadvertently alienate uh, the moviegoers, uh, you know, so if you're a big time Republican, it's, it's worse now than it was then. I, I think if you're on the other side of the, the freaking aisle, you know, I'm not going to support you. And so a lot of wrestlers would, was, uh, you know, they just weren't, they weren't ready to go there. And so in any event, I thought that, uh, Steve's going heel and I'm, we've talked about this casually, but I, I and I try to talk him out of it. Uh, endlessly till it was almost ad nauseum. I finally had a tap. It ain't going to work. And you know, Vince's deal was real simple. And I, when he told me this reasoning for him doing it, because I don't think Vince really had the full confidence that this was the right decision, but here's the bottom line. Still one of Steve's uh, phrases. We as a company, because of all his contributions, and what he meant to the business, what he meant more specifically to WWE and helping facilitate with his productivity, the company going public, uh, we owed it to him to try it. Steve was very, very motivated to do it. Uh, he wanted to be a heel. And I said, you, you, you're never going to wrestle like a heel. Are you going to retreat? Are you going to beg off? Are you going to, are you going to take a powder when you get the, it's too hot in the kitchen? Are you going to change your style? Well, he didn't want to change his style because it worked. So there, I said, you just made my point. It's working. And so uh, in any event, uh, I thought that that uh, decision was, was, uh, not going to work. It didn't work, but nonetheless, we did owe it to Steve to try what he wanted to try. And I don't think that's just a Steve thing. I think any top person that's contributed as much as he has, or in that same hunt, uh, deserves, uh, the leeway and the opportunity to express themselves creatively. You think that, uh, 
when Chris Jericho goes to Tony Khan and says, I got an idea that Tony doesn't listen. Of course, of course. he listens to Tony listens to everybody, John Moxley, all these guys. So it's a matter of, uh, it's a matter then of just doing the right thing to the talent for the talent. And so we thought we were doing the right thing to make Steve happier and Hey, look, maybe it works. Who knows? Who knows? It's going to, work. we didn't think so, but you can't say for sure. Right. So I think that, uh, Mark, that WrestleMania 17 in the Astrodome was a pivotal day, uh, in this whole storytelling of Steve finally saying, man, I, I got to get out of here for a while. And by the way, that's not, uh, the only sort of bad thing that happens on the way to Steve making this decision. Let's get to the King of the ring. 2001 Austin defeats Jericho and Benoit in about 27, 28 minutes by pinning Benoit when Benoit seemingly knocks himself out after dropping Jericho with a back suplex off the top. And then late in the bout as part of the invasion angle, the world champ from WCW Booker T comes out of the crowd to attack Austin on the floor before putting him through the Spanish announce table and then leaving back through the crowd when security is trying to come down to grab him. And in his book, Austin just sort of casually states I'd been off work. And he's talking about in the summer of 2001, because I got three broken vertebrae in my back when Booker T clocked me on the announcer's table over at continental airlines during his debut. So this is, um, this has been a, a much talked about situation here. I think Booker T has said that Bruce Pritchard called him and said, book, you've got to do something. I don't know. Steve broke his hand. You broke his hand. And Booker said something like, well, give me his phone number. I'll give him a call and apologize. And Bruce said, I can't give you his phone number, but I'll tell you what he's at this hotel. If you just probably meet him at the hotel in the morning and just pack his bags on the way to the ring for him. And Booker T cuts <laughs> him off and says, hold the hell up. I ain't packing no bags. Uh, and then of course later, you know, they squash all of this, but it's a hell of a way to debut the invasion angle to have the world champion attack stone cold, Steve Austin, but on your first night in and you hurt the golden goose, this is, uh, like the worst possible circumstance for Booker T is it not like in his head, he's got to be thinking, oh shit, what have I done? No, I mean, yeah. we, we understand accidents happen in wrestling. But you've got to feel like, man, my first night in and I hurt the top guy, this is doomed. Yeah, it was uh, ill-fated. It was exactly the worst case scenario. It was exactly the worst case scenario for Booker T. And I, I got to hand it to Book. You know, uh, Booker had been through a lot of challenges in his life, you know, from being incarcerated and, 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 uh, and then working through a white system as a very uh, uh, articulate and intelligent black man, uh, you know, I, I, I was one of the sad commentaries I heard one time when I first got in the wrestling business and when the territories had their un, unwritten quota of how many African Americans they would have on the roster, you know, and I was working for an owner who's uh, cowboy Bill Watts, who uh, later on in his career was, you know, considered to be a racist guy and, uh, you know, the Hank Aaron thing at TBS and all that stuff. But Bill not only had a black top baby face, he also had a black booker. And I've been in meetings with him on, on conference calls with people that for other promoters, that were just racist as hell that could, they, he said, you're going to ruin the business cowboy. He said, well, the only color I like is green and my black guys produce and they bring me green and I have no issues with, I said, I love Ernie lad like a brother. And he did. And he, he kind of adopted junkyard dog, uh, which we'll, we'll uh, talk about in subsequent weeks, but, uh, uh, you know, Bill was, a he was a very, he very defensive of that situation. So Booker was always fighting, a, a an uphill pull I'm the guy that told Booker, I think he mentioned his hall of fame speech. You need to let people know who you are. You let people need to know your journey, man. Cause there's a lot of people that are going to be able to identify with that. And there's a lot of young fans. They're going to say, well, hell Booker T worked through all these adversities, all these challenges and look at him now. So I, 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 I encourage Booker to tell that story about him going to prison and, and that stuff. And, uh, you know, it's part of his journey, man. I said, don't hide it from him. Look at where you are. If you were, if you went to prison and you're a, you're a no, you're a, you're deadbeat, uh, then that's maybe something you want to keep under wraps, but you're not, you're, you're a family man. You're, you're, you know, you got a, you, you got a, a life, you, you're a prominent citizen in the city of Houston. Let people know how you feel. Let people know that you've made mistakes, but look what you've done to rebound. So yeah, Booker got a bad start there. And 
But, you know, we all knew Booker was a great worker. We all knew Booker was a reliable guy, and we, and we had good plans for Booker going forward. Probably of, of the guys we signed in that original uh, invasion stuff, Conrad, Booker T might have been the number one guy that we said, we, we really need to get Booker T in here to get him to get, you know, he's, he's going to get over. And, uh, so that's how we looked at that. And so B Booker was a, Hey, he handled it, man. He handled it because he'd already been through hell. He'd already been galvanized. He was, t he was a tough, mentally tough guy and, and physically tough, but it wasn't a good deal for book. But I don't know that anybody up from management said, Oh, what have we done? And it wasn't like the guy's a rookie. He's a very accomplished, skilled talent. It just was an accident that happened. And, uh, you know, we didn't, I didn't have any idea that, you know, I knew Steve back was bothering him, but you know, until he got it diagnosed, you know, it was a serious deal. He got, he had a broken back. So it was not good. It was not good, but everybody prevailed at the end of the day. And as if this isn't enough after being on the shelf for a little bit, when it's time to uh, start getting ready for WrestleMania season, because that's always sort of the way in this era, people looked at you know, big stories and big paydays. What are we doing for WrestleMania? What are we doing for SummerSlam? What are we doing for Royal Rumble? And on, uh, you know, by Royal Rumble, you've sort of got WrestleMania figured out, but Royal Rumble gets you ready for the big show. And now right before that happens, well, the WWE is going to change again because Vince is going to sign Hogan Hall and Nash, the NWO. We're going to do an NWO 2002 version here of an invasion. And it's been often discussed. You didn't do something with that. Yeah. Just turn it off. And as if that's not enough, you know, after being injured with the whole Booker T thing, he's going to wind up not being where he wants to be for SummerSlam, And then of course the next big pay-per-view is the Royal rumble, but that really just gets you set up for WrestleMania. But around that same time, Vince decides to throw another curveball, and he's going to bring back the NWO Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, and Scott Hall are now going to invade WWE. And he's, he and storyline being Vince McMahon is saying he's going to inject poison into the company, but this is a pretty controversial decision. I mean, even Meltzer would write, uh, Vince decided to bring in Hogan Hall and Nash, three of the most influential people in the death of world championship wrestling back to the WWF, possibly to reform the NWO. I can't tell you for certain whether they've put pen to paper and signed contracts yet, but Vince did pull aside the road agent Sunday afternoon to inform them of his decision. It really came as a slap in the face to the people who Vince had lied to repeatedly telling them he wasn't going to sign them no matter what, while at the same time, privately negotiating with them. And I understand that this is a controversial decision because you are just not too terribly removed. I mean, less than a year at this point from WCW going under and it was a bitter war and these guys were going back and forth. And where were you on this? Do you, did you think, uh, this was a good move. Were you in favor of it? I know outwardly, uh, some other guys weren't really popular on this idea. Well, uh, I was skeptical, but I knew that if we got all the stars aligned, that all three of those guys could help us a great deal. And again, they were heels, uh, was NWO seeming to me, they were heels positioned as heels more often than not on, on nitro and so forth that we needed. It gives, it gives our top baby faces new people to work with. And, you know, I, I knew Steve and Kevin Nash had a real good relationship. Uh, and I, I didn't know, I don't think Hogan and Austin had, I don't think that they had any relationship. I don't think that Steve did dislike Hogan. I just think that they just had not been at the same place at the same time and had worked together to, to, to any degree, if any. And then, uh, and of course, Steve knew Scott, uh, very well. So, uh, you know, it was the, the, my issue with Vince is always the same. If they, if they're willing to come here and, and, and integrate with the team in our locker room, then let's give it a shot. Uh, but if they're, if they have to have special treatment, they got to have their own locker room, the end of yo, I said, that's a good way to alienate those son of bitches from everybody. And he agreed. Uh, I said, but here's the other thing. Whereas at that time and for several years prior to that, and after that, I was a guy that was negotiating with talents. I said, it, it's not going to help us, our cause to get these guys signed. If you do not lead the negotiation, they're going to want to do business with the head of the company. 
And I don't have any problem with that uh, egocentrically or what have you. I, it's, I'm a team guy. And if your goal, Vince, is to get these guys signed and you, your vision tells you that this is going to be a great hire for us, then it's my obligation uh, as your employee and as your head of talent relations to support that. If you're there and I can't change your mind, no different than the Austin turn. If this is what we're going to do, then by God, I'm going to buy into it hundred percent and support it. So the key there was, will they come in with a good attitude and be willing to change their, cause they, those guys are, were power brokers in, in WCW. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, for sure. They have influenced the locker room. That's why they are so uh, polarizing. Some guys loved them because they're on the right side of the aisle. Some guys didn't like them whatsoever because they looked at them as being greedy or, or, or whatever. And they were on the other side of the aisle. So it was, uh, that's kind of where I was on the deal to the two things, attitude and Vince, you got to do the negotiation. At least let them see, get the FaceTime with them. Let them know that they're wanted. Let them know that we would like them to be here. We have some, we know this is a different company Hulk than it was when you were here last Kevin Scott, same for you guys. So, uh, and we had a pretty, uh, harmonious locker room by and large, you're never going to have peace in a Valley uh, of a rest pro wrestling locker room. I don't care what company you're with. There's always going to be, uh, you know, skepticism. There's going to be paranoia, anxiety. It's things, those natures, because these guys are all of the level Conrad to come in and take top spots. So some of your top guys who had, who, who had the, uh, in their mind's eye, uh, the right, and they did to speak their mind. Uh, there was, t- there's a t- couple of agendas there. Are they going to, are they going to come up here and be shit disturbers? Uh, and the other thing that they would say, they may take my spot. Right. So, so that's, that comes back to the great and Vince loved the competition, you know? So, uh, I, I, I had mixed emotions, but that's what the boss wanted to do. It's like, Hey, if Nick Saban calls a play, you could bet your sweet ass, a quarterback, no matter who it is, is going to run it period. Well, time out coach. You think we should run this sweep? I was thinking about a pass. I don't give a fuck what you're thinking about. We're going to run the sweep because that's the play I called type deal. I know Saban's not the offensive coordinator, but you, the point is when the head guy says something uh, in, in, in any environment, you, you should, if you're, if you go and keep your job, uh, and you enjoy the money he's paying you, then try to do what he wants. Simple. We should also mention that you really hit the nail on the head when, when you talked about, you know, guys weren't being worried about losing their spot. I mean, Kevin Nash even says. Why would people, and he's talking about the boys be excited about the NWO coming in. It's not like they're coming in mid card. So everybody knows if you've been toiling away at the mid card or working underneath, as they say, if some more quote unquote top guys come in, well, you're that much further away from your goal of being one of those sad top guys. And you addressed it in your, in your, uh, discussion there, the Hulk Hogan, Austin relationship. Austin, when he goes to ECW spoofs Hulk Hogan quite a bit. And apparently it comes out years later that Austin even had an idea to pitch himself as the brother of Hulk Hogan. Of course, that never happened in WCW and probably thankfully so. But when he comes to the WWF now, Austin is the top dog. And Austin has been quoted as saying Hogan was open to having a match. Me, not so much. I thought the styles would clash. I just didn't think it would be that great of a match. And I do think when you're sort of fantasy booking as a wrestling fan, Jim, you, you, you think about, man, what if Mike Tyson could fight Muhammad Ali? Oh man. What if, what if you had Johnny Unitas on one side and Tom Brady on the other? Uh, what if we could see LeBron and Michael Jordan go toe to toe? And now it feels like, Hey man, we've got the Titan of the prior decade. And now the current top guy, let's put them against each other. And Austin just doesn't see it. Did you think that was a missed opportunity? Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was, it was a missed opportunity, but, uh, you got to have everybody in the, in a, in a match on the same page. Right. So, and I, and Steve had it in his mind that Hogan's uh, style and Steve's style were like oil and water. Uh, they, they he just didn't <clears throat> feel the, excuse me, the chemistry, uh, of the, of having a, a really good. Not, not a, Austin was never about having good matches. Austin was about having great matches and he 
knew better than anybody else in the world who he could work the best with. And, uh, and Hogan wasn't on that list. And so, uh, and, and maybe Steve, and Steve could be wrong too. I'm not saying that Hogan and, and Austin could have a good match. I mean, my God, look at the match that, that rock had at WrestleMania 18 with the rock. So, you know, it was just, a it, it was, it was just a, a Steve's stubborn guy and he just didn't feel it. And so, <clears throat> but that's what we, that's what we're trying to explain in this meetings. <clears throat> pardon me with these guys is the fact that, you know, heck, uh, uh, it's a new, it's a new, there's a new sheriff in town. His name is stone cold. It, it's not Hulkamania anymore, but if we could use Hulkamania and, and, and what it was in a more, uh, in a bitter way, an angry way, whatever, maybe we could get uh, a WrestleMania out of it. That's kind of the idea, but it just never came to fruition. It just didn't, it never did happen because Steve didn't push for it. Uh, I think Hogan probably would have got, got along with it because it's been a great payday and he could, he could, he would work with Austin. So it was, uh, it was interesting times. Personalities have so much to say about how good a match is and talents have got to be willing to cooperate and, and to be giving, to be unselfish. And, uh, I don't know that that would have happened in that match. I got to tell you though, it's almost a blessing that it doesn't happen while it is a great dream match. What we got instead is rock and Hogan, which was just absolute magic. I mean, so many of today's wrestlers, including Cody Rhodes would list this as one of the best matches of all time, just based on the excitement and the crowd reaction. I mean, listen, if you, if you press mute, it's not nearly the same experience, but with the sound, uh, it is without question, one of the biggest and best spectacles in the history of wrestling. And certainly one of the most iconic WrestleMania moments. But it wouldn't have happened had Austin been open to the match and, and to your point, and maybe Steve's that match just wouldn't have been as good that maybe it was a little less brawling, a little more, uh, showmanship, if you will, with the rock in there. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'm drinking my screwdriver this morning. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I think, uh, you're right. I think you're exactly right. I'd point on the pairing, the chemistry. And the, uh, between rock and Hulk was excellent. Uh, they had, as you said, the match should have closed the show. Uh, they didn't do any favors for triple H and, uh, Chris Jericho who closed the show for the title. Uh, we, we didn't do them any favors. No. They should, they should have gone on last, uh, the Hogan and rocks have gone on last, which I know is going to upset the apple cart with some traditionalists of which I am one of that. You always close the show with the, with the title. You know, uh, uh, we had a match on AEW here a while back, uh, that Moxley, I said, I don't think Moxley, Moxley didn't close the show at the pay-per-view. It, the pay-per-view was done with the stadium stampede, which is again, a, a, a little, you know, a little, uh, uh, different route. Moxley didn't give a shit. He was fine. He had his good match with Brody Lee. They were physical. They beat the shit out of each other and, uh, and liked it. Uh, I saw that picture on, on social media of, of Moxley's, uh, bruised tailbone. I had a bruised tailbone at playing high school football, I guess I'm being knocked on my ass so many times, but it finally caught up with me and man, that is the most annoying. You can't get comfortable. You can't sit, you can't sleep. You, you know, it's just, you, you can't find a spot that that damn thing's not hurting, but that was a deal. You know, I think that tr- we, we, we went a traditional way at WrestleMania 18 to close with triple H and Jericho, two very strong workers, two very loyal guys, two hall of fame level talents and the title, the title was the thing. And so, but in hindsight, knowing how the audience reacted to rock and Hogan, you know, it would take, you know, you, you gotta be a buffoon not to say that's, the, that's what should have closed the show, but it didn't at that point in time, but it was a, the Austin and Hogan lack of chemistry that you said so wisely pointed out. It gave us Hogan and, uh, rock. And that was a match that again, we're still talking about all these years later. So let's get back to the Royal rumble. The final four in 2002 are triple H, Mr. Perfect, uh, Kurt angle. And of course, Austin, uh, we should mention this is sort of triple H's coming out party. He's been on the shelf since he tore his quad. They did all those fantastic, uh, promos to U two songs. And he comes back has a big outing at Royal rumble. Of course. Uh, he's going to wind up winning last eliminating Kurt angle and right around this time in late January, 
on the Ross report, you would reveal that Austin is going to be heading to San Antonio to have his neck examined by Dr. Lloyd Youngblood. Mm -hmm. So it's worth mentioning that even though he's back, he's not still at a hundred percent. He's still got these lingering neck injuries. Uh, he's not as hot as he once was because he did the whole heel thing, tried the invasion thing, got hurt on the Booker T thing. Doesn't win the rumble has turned down an opportunity to work with Hogan. And now his neck's hurting. This is starting to feel like we're in a pressure cooker and this thing's going to burst. Yeah, we were just, he, he was, Steve was he, being, he, uh, Mr. Pronoun boy. God damn it. Jr. Pronouns, son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, his wagon got packed with negative material. You know, I sit here on the show many times. I don't, I don't pack any negatives in my carry on. When I go back to Jacksonville, it's, it's, I'm a happy guy. I'm, I'm smiling as best I can smile. And I, uh, love it. But Steve, in addition to that, you know, there were, there were marital issues in any of us, Conrad, you know, uh, you know, I've had two failed marriages. I'm not proud of it. I could have been a better husband. I could have been a better everything in that era, but wrestling was my life. And I prioritized my work over my family, which I will regret till I die. Nonetheless, much like the Hogan scenario with Ralston, the fact that I was single when I met Jan was, was the, the blessing of my life without a doubt. God, I miss her, but it, things happen for whatever reasons they happen. Hell, I can't figure it all out, but all I know is. My friend Stone Cold was very frustrated with creative. He's very, he was very sensitive of his mortality as a pro wrestler. And that's all he ever wanted to do. So when you're faced, you're looking in the mirror at the guy that, that finally accomplished all these goals, has made all this great money. Uh, you know, shoot, uh, I, I just, it was too much. And he, and he, Steve did not process it well all the time. He's like a lot of us. I internalize a lot of shit, man. And I, and I've learned, I've got to be a, be a better, a freer communicator and to get this stuff, get it, get it off your chest, get, you know, express yourself. And he wasn't real good about that. He was a very introverted guy in that regard. Very, he didn't trust a lot of people, hardly anybody. He trusted me and I'm, I'm blessed to say that. Uh, but I, I think on the creative side, he was so intimidating at times because of his presence, his presence was so intimidating that I don't know that he had great communication with the creative staff. I mean, this is the same creative staff that wanted Steve to lose at WrestleMania that WrestleMania 18. We're talking about the Scott hall. Yeah. Let's talk about how the Scott hall thing comes to be, you know, we're in WrestleMania season. Now, once we've passed Royal rumble, we know triple H is one. He's got a title shot, but now it's time for the sort of lame duck pay-per-view in between Royal rumble and WrestleMania. It's no way out. And Austin is going to get a title shot against Chris Jericho at this undisputed WWF championship with the idea being if Austin wins, well, now he will, fa he'll be facing his old tag team partner, uh, cause they were teaming together when triple H tore his quad. So WrestleMania could in theory look like triple H versus Steve Austin, but we know that doesn't come to be Jericho wins. And then Hogan Hall and Nash would destroy Austin after the match and Hall even gives Austin his own stunner. And then of course they leave him laying and spray paint NWO on his back. And this is very old school NWO back to 1996. But the real story is Austin now has an opponent for WrestleMania and it's Scott Hall and Meltzer would write Austin angle and Bradshaw were the three most vocal guys in the locker room last week about not wanting the NWO to come in. Austin's big thing is that he and the other guys have worked way too hard, bringing the in-ring work up to the level it's at now to throw it all away, having shitty matches with these three stiffs. Austin was approached last week and told to think of ideas for a program with hall. And he initially nixed it saying everyone knew hall wasn't going to last until WrestleMania. So it's pointless to build up anything with him. Obviously he changed his mind since he took the stoner from hall at the pay-per-view we should mention that Scott Hall is still active in, uh, his fight with addiction at this point. I mean, I guess you always are, you're always sort of in recovery, but he is fresh off of some incidents in WCW the year prior that weren't, uh, becoming and the best version of Scott. So Austin doesn't have a lot of confidence in him, but for whatever reason decides to go with it with the angle here at the end of the pay-per-view, did you talk to Austin about his decision to 
not want to work with hall and how did you get him to come around if he changed his mind well uh i didn't know the finish was going to be uh you know the uh, hall going over i didn't even that wasn't even on my, on my radar you know i don't think he takes stone cold to wrestlemania and beat him well i'm not saying that he beat him at wrestlemania i'm saying it no way out after the pay-per-view after he loses to jericho the nwo debuts beats the shit out of austin spray paints right. him but i mean Scott Hall hit Steve Austin with a stunner. And this is on the heels of apparently a few days prior saying, no, I don't want to work with Scott Hall. He's not even going to make it. But then somehow he comes around to the idea or else they wouldn't do this angle. Do you think Vince McMahon had to sell him on? Well, Hey, uh, what if we just have you wrestle Scott and we won't give Kevin Nash a match and he can sort of be, uh, the guy, the sixth man. So if something does go sideways, you can just pivot and have your match with Nash instead. Is that no, that, that was, that's a lot. No, that's good thinking. And I think I, th- I was going to say, I think Kevin Nash had a big hand because Kevin and Steve were friends. Then, uh, they've been friends since WCW days. They're both kind of getting their shit together and, and, and starting to roll. Uh, they're still great friends today. So that friendship wasn't, uh, you know, uh, a, just a temporary thing. It wasn't a, a fad. They've, they've been friends for God dang it. Well over 20 years. And as I mentioned, still to this very day. So I'm sure that what your, your logic is, is spot on, uh, that, that Kevin was, would be there. And, and I think Steve would have been happy to work with Kevin. You know, they, they knew each other. They knew each other's strengths and weaknesses, but, uh, and Steve could have worked around any issues that Kevin might've had with his knees or something like that. The promos have been good. You know, the, the, the poster would have been good. All that good stuff that Vince likes. So, uh, and, and as he should marketing wise, but I think Scott had, or I think, uh, Kevin had a, had a hand in the, in the conversations with Steve to, to find some sort of comfort level, uh, for this thing. And the other thing we hoped would happen, Conrad, was that Scott seeing this opportunity to be in a high main event level match at WrestleMania might give him hope that there's still time in his career, he could still accomplish a lot of great things and he could make a lot of money working with Austin and having a successful program with Austin would normally get you, uh, uh, the, the one or two pay-per-view main events, but it also got you. And when it meant something, uh, house show main events, live events. And, uh, you know, that was a big part of the income of all of our guys at that point in time, because we were selling lots of tickets. And, you know, that roster that these guys you mentioned and how they'd worked hard to raise the work level, uh, that was always something we talked about. You know, I, I talk about to every guy that we, we brought in, you know, we, we, we have to improve our in ring product. We have to be more physical and more logical. And, uh, and the guys bought in, they bought into it. That's what they wanted. They didn't want to be entertainers. They all aggressors always look at themselves as athletes. And when any management group tries to treat them like they're entertainers, the sports entertainment thing. That might be a nice little handle for wall street or for advertisers because you sure as shit don't want to say pro wrestling. My God, that'd be terrible. So, uh, I, I think, uh, I, I think that, the, you know, the, the, the wrestlers want to be athletes. They're at, they are athletes and they want to be treated as such. So, uh, but they, they all bought into that concept. But the, I think Steve's theory was, does Scott have that left in him at yeah, one, you know, Scott's got a great mind. He's still got a great mind. I have a lot of respect for Scott Hall to this very day when I'm in a, he, he texts me every now and then, or he'll, he'll tweet me just to see how I'm doing. And you know, that doesn't happen all the time. So I got a lot of respect for Scott, but Scott's demons were his biggest opponent. It wasn't the chemistry of stone cold or whatever. It was his, uh, his other issues that he had to continue to battle. As you mentioned every day, if you're an addict, you're an alcoholic, whatever it may be. And you're trying to go, you're trying to go clean. Every day is a challenge. And so uh, that was kind of our, our, the reservation. What's, where are we on this thing? It's, can he, can he kick the habit, so to speak? Uh, and, uh, can he, you know, can he, and can he, cause we thought, well, if he's healthy physically and his mind is where it should be, which we knew he had a great mind, then maybe we, we, we steal a couple of main events out of this thing. So, uh, again, Scott's promo work was against Austin would have been, would have been awesome. So any, anyway, it's just a, it was a tough deal. It was, there was a, so many missing cards in the deck and, you know, you try to try to rob Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. But at the end of the day, it's just, uh, 
it it wasn't a formula that was going to work. And then, you know, when I think when Steve, I think Steve heard about this late, what's another thing, how do you, from a creative standpoint, you got your top guy who's proven to be your top guy. How do you not communicate with him? What you want to do at WrestleMania? Because they were intimidated to talk to Steve and because they either wanted Vince or me to do it because we both had great reports with Steve. I think my report Steve was, was a little bit better than Vince's because I think he trusted me more. That's just my opinion. That made me my ego talking as well. So take that in consideration folks. So, uh, that was, that's kind of where we work on right on that deal. I just, we found ourselves in an unattainable situation that just, we could not make work. And that's really frustrating. Years later, Kevin Nash would say the original plan for WrestleMania was supposed to be a big night for the NWO. Scott Hall is supposed to beat Steve Austin and then Hogan would lose to the rock, but the NWO would come out and destroy the rock. And that would be the last thing everybody would see is the NWO standing tall over the rock. But of course, Hogan doesn't work as a heel against the rock and, uh, the fans just won't let him be a bad guy. So it's a, a major pivot. Um, we should talk a little bit about the way we got to this particular show. Um, Hall does what Scott was known for doing. Uh, and he hung out with fans and he probably had too much to drink and that changed everything. Meltzer would write, here's where it gets weird. Nobody, not Vince or anybody on the writing crew told anyone about this decision. Even Austin was not informed that the finish had been changed. On Saturday night, Hall allegedly went out drinking with a bunch of fans from England and showed up hungover at WrestleMania. Austin blew his stack, said Vince, since Vince had told everyone that if Hall screwed up one more time, he was done for. We got one report from someone who hung out with Hall all day Sunday saying he appeared to be okay, but others disagreed with that assessment. Austin went to Vince and told him that Hall was totally unprofessional for showing up at WrestleMania in less than perfect condition, and he wanted their finish of the match changed. Vince, having already decided to change it days earlier, acquiesced to Austin's demand. Hall, Nash, and X-Pac, also unaware that the finish had already been changed, got pissed off and then blamed Austin. Their gripe was that the NWO would be killed dead by having to do two jobs at WrestleMania, and the writing crew, not wanting to take any heat from Nash, just kept quiet and let Austin take the heat. This is remarkable, and it's something that doesn't get talked about a lot when you're talking about all the things that happened that led to Steve saying, fuck this, I'm out of here. But going into this, Vince already realizes, man, this is just not exactly what I want. I'm going to change it and have Steve go over. But when Hall allegedly has a night out drinking, that's enough to set Steve off. He asked for it to change and Vince allows Austin to think that, okay, I'm going to let you have your way, even though he had already changed his mind and the writing team, not wanting to get in the middle, just goes along with it. So now there's even more quote unquote heat, if you will, between the NWO and Steve Austin, when really Vince had made the decision ahead of time. When did you know the finish was changed or did you get into those particulars or creative in this era? Oh yeah. I, when it came to Austin, I got into everything. That's how that's good management. In my view, the coach always does that. You take care. You think that uh, Bruce Arians, I'm going to take care of Tom Brady in Tampa Bay. He's going to acquiesce to play calling. He's going to acquiesce to doing what Brady does best, whatever that may be. And in, in Brady's mind, of course he is. He's the franchise, you know, uh, as Tom Brady goes, so goes the Tampa Bay bucks. It's that simple. Well, they got a good defense or they got a good kicker. Okay. Bullshit. Uh, Tom Brady is the, star, the straw that serves the drink now in Tampa Bay and Bruce Arias is going to let Tom Brady be Tom Brady. He he's 42 years old. He knows what he can do well, what he can't. And so, you know, in other words, you wouldn't run the same plays that for Kyler Murray in Arizona, where you got a little, a little option where the quarterback can run on some, and, and has some design runs. I'd be shocked if they had very many design runs for Tom Brady in Tampa Bay, because that's not what he does well. So, uh, but I, I was, uh, I found out and I heard about the writing team. So we're going to, we're going to do some heat thing with Austin. We're going to beat him with Scott and blah, blah, blah. And I said, you're what are you shitting me? What's the logic behind that? And I said, and, and have you communicated that to the talent? Oh no, no, we haven't said a word just between us and Vince. So I go to Vince, you know, are we going to beat Austin at WrestleMania? Well, uh, I'm thinking about it. 
And I said, I think it's a bad decision because that was the way Vince and I communicated one-on-one. He didn't want bullshit and I didn't challenge him to the point of being obnoxious. I just said, I, I think that's the wrong decision to make. I think it's the wrong decision to make. And I think it's going to fucking piss off Steve because he knows he can't have the match. He wants to have at WrestleMania. Look, Conrad, look at the matches that Steve has had at WrestleMania. He had that great match where he won the title, Shawn Michaels. He had three with rock. Uh, he had, uh, all these other great matches at WrestleMania's and he knew that he couldn't follow that act with Scott just wasn't going to work. So, uh, I, I just, you know, it was, it was, so Steve Vince thought about it more. And I think the more he thought about it, it was that that's the way it was. So I'll give you a story about the WrestleMania 18. Jan and I uh, were there in Toronto and we went to dinner the night before WrestleMania with Chris Benoit and his wife, Nancy, uh, just found us a little spot there. Uh, you know, I, I might've been even walking distance from the hotel. I'm not sure, but it wasn't far. It's you know, a little local spot in, in Toronto. So the three the four of us went to dinner. Well, Scott was there sitting across the room at the bar at this restaurant. And he was, he was, uh, he had had a few drinks, no doubt how much, I don't know, but he, you could tell he was, uh, he was, uh, uh, influenced and Benoit was fucking livid. Same basic old school reasoning that Steve had. If you can't come to WrestleMania and be straight and be prepared and be at your very, very best mentally and physically then why are you here? And so Ben Wall seethed through that whole dinner, you know, and finally, you know, between the other three of us, his wife and my wife and myself, we changed the topic and moved on and, and just had a nice dinner. But it, it was, it was very disconcerting that Scott would be, have this great opportunity to come back and to be uh, in play at this level, no matter the finish, you know, this bullshit about, well, we, we, we get beat at WrestleMania, it's going to kill us then you must have zero fucking confidence in your goddamn work. You're telling me you're not a good enough worker to lose and maintain credibility. That's it. That's, that's the art form of pro wrestling. My God. So, uh, I, I, I just, that was, it, it was, a, it was a, it was a tip off that this is, we're still in choppy waters here again, holding out hope that Scott, maybe just having a night out. You know, maybe he got overserved. Maybe somebody brought in too many drinks, what, blah, 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 whatever. You try to make every excuse you can. But the bottom line was, was that uh, there was evidence there that Scott still had issues that he was having chal- a challenging time dealing with. We should also mention that, uh, Meltzer would write in the observer that Vince made the decision to pivot away from Scott Hall winning after seeing Scott Hall's performance on the March 11th raw. It's a handicap match and Meltzer would write the crew decided that it would be an absolute disgrace for hall to win at the company's biggest show of the year. Plus there's a belief that hall won't be around much longer. So it was felt that would also be a mistake to put him over Austin on such a huge stage. If there's no guarantee he'd be in the company a month from now. And as a result, Vince agreed to change the finish. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, you can sort of feel the mood changing with the way Austin has been handled. Cause you got to remember he was in the most critically acclaimed match at WrestleMania 13. He becomes the world champion at WrestleMania 14, WrestleMania 15. It's a, a, a big match with the rock WrestleMania 17. It's the biggest match with the rock. I mean, that was the WrestleMania that set all the records at 17. And now the follow-up to that. And he's working with Scott Hall and supposed to lose. Now the finish has been changed, of course, the day of, but Austin's not happy. Even just being in this spot, he would write in his book at WrestleMania 18. I was in the third or fourth match and it wasn't even the main event. It was just some match on the card, the way I looked at it. And I wasn't happy with that at all. You can tell me the business goes in cycles and sometimes you're not as hot as you want to be, but I was, I was on that card excuse me, where I was on that card didn't make sense to me. The match wasn't promoted properly. It wasn't built properly, nothing. And that's really hard to argue. You know, I mean, if you're the biggest star and you look at the tremendous build they had on the way to WrestleMania 17, you know, we've even talked about it here on the show that Limp Biscuit my way video for the main event and that sit down interview that you did with both guys and sold out Astrodome, all kinds of records. 
but that thing was a collision course for months and months. Meanwhile, this one, you don't really know what he's doing at WrestleMania at Royal rumble. You find out just one month prior after the pay-per-view where he loses to Jericho and then hall hits the stunner and you think, well, this must be it. That's not what you're supposed to do for your top guy, a three or four week build. And he's going to be the third or fourth match. If you were Steve Austin, wouldn't you have been a little insulted to be in this spot? Hell yeah. It was, it was a absolutely. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Because it was a, it felt so thrown together with short-term thinking. And, uh, you know, here's the other thing about that. We had guys on the roster that would have been, that deserved that opportunity to work with Steve at WrestleMania to work with Austin at WrestleMania is going to help you get over it, whether you win or you lose. And some people may be rolling their eyes right now. Well, how do you get over if you lose? Because you're a great worker for the love of God, man, this shit is there. This is fictional. Uh, this is not the NFL. This is not MLB or NBA. Or any of this. this is a fictional presentation showbiz like presentation. Uh, but it was ill planned, ill thought out. It was an idea. Oh yeah. By the way, I'll give you an example of, of, of oh, by the way, when, uh, Vince and I were, were looking at the card for WrestleMania 17 and he had a shell of a card from creative and his own Vince's ideas, obviously, and other suggestions that many of us had given. And I was trying to manage the entire roster. So I look at the card and I said, well, there's, it's a hell of a card Vince, but we got two guys that aren't booked that need to be booked who undertaker and triple H. Oh, God damn. Yeah. Oh, goddamn damn. Right. They both deserve to be on WrestleMania. They worked their ass off. They've been great soldiers. They've been great teammates. They just, they've done great. So, uh, they got booked and undertaker. If you remember undertaker, wrestled triple H at WrestleMania 17 and a cold as ice match. I, I, they I, went, I had no idea. It was all born out of Vince booked the card and just didn't have them on there at all. Like at this point. I mean, I could almost understand. Well, no, I guess you really couldn't understand triple H, but my goodness, undertaker has been with you forever in a fucking day. How do you forget that guy? Well, it's just, it was just oversight and you got a lot on your plate and it's no, no excuse other than human error. And, but when he realized they had not been booked, he quickly said, we've got to fix that right. immediately. Right. It was like, well, let me think about that. No, it wasn't that at all. It was just the fact that the, the card that was presented to Vince by the creative people did not have those two stars on it, which tells me somebody ain't paying fucking attention. And this whole issue that we're talking about today was born in a lack of communication and being straightforward. And if there's one guy ever in the wrestling business, there's been a lot of, by the way, undertakers that way as well. And among, among many, but the way you deal with stone cold is you deal with it straight up, right? You know, you give them the headline. You don't just get, you give them the story. You get, here's the headline. Here's what we want to do. And then you back it up with fact or reason or whatever it may be, but whatever you do, you don't become uh, deceptive, uh, with this deal. And that's, I think that's what Steve felt like he was being worked and uh, whether he was, or he wasn't, I don't think anybody would work stone cold, uh, purposely intentionally, but that's how it came off. And, and, and at the matter of fact, if you're in court. You know, you got a got a weak case to try to defend because that's really what happened. He was taken for granted, and he w- he was put in a position that did not fit who he was. It's bad casting. Hey, what if you put John Wayne in the movie, Conrad? And I know I'm worried out John Wayne this week, but goddamn man, you're going to get him shot in the first scene? Right. I don't think so. I don't think so. He started it. No matter what was on top, or how the card was booked, Stone Cold at WrestleMania was still huge business because. He had proven to be a pay-per-view selling son of a gun, a machine. And so, but he had to always have somebody that he could go out. Steve's issue was, I got to go out and have the best match on the card every night. You know, I told the story before about, I booked him in a Vince wanting to work with Mark Mara one time in LA and, uh, or, and, uh, and so Steve didn't want to work with Mark Mara. And so I rebooked the card and Vince got, you know, pissed at me. I said, well, I talked to the talent. He didn't want to work with him. Right. And you know, well, we got to give Merrow up. You know, I said, I understand. I like Mark Merrow, but Steve doesn't feel like there's a chemistry. He doesn't feel like he can go out and have the best match on the card with Mark Merrow at this point in time. Another time Austin did the same deal. LA again, big market. 
I had him on uh, early in the card so he could get out of there early and, and make TV a little bit of rest. He pissed him off, called me raising hell. I worked all my life to go on last. It means something to me. It still means something to me. And, you know, and I don't want to go in the middle of the card, no matter what the reason is. He said, I want to go on last. And I said, then, then by God, you're going to go on last. You'd be the last one to leave the building. And that's what you like. And so, I, and then Vince got the agent for it. What I thought you, well, I thought we decided to put Austin on early. I said, we did decide that, but he undecided it. <laughs> he, <laughs> he didn't want, he, he didn't want to do it. So I said, you know, your old story, your story that you learned from your dad, it's you got to get, no matter what, you got to get the match in the ring. And so I got the match in the ring. They had a, who he, I don't remember who I, who I rebooked him with. It didn't matter, but they had a real good match for Austin. It was always about the bell to bell. Am I going to be in a position where I could possibly have the best match on the card? What can I do to increase my chances of that happening? And, uh, it's the first thing you look at is who you're dancing with. If you guys don't have the rhythm, you don't, you don't, you don't hear the same music. It's just not going to work. It really is, uh, something that in hindsight, you can see coming, you know, this whole burnout, um, we should mention that he doesn't even go to the traditional post WrestleMania party. Uh, he would describe in his book that he was fried, burnout, frustrated, and him and Deborah skipped the WrestleMania party. He finds out the next day that they don't have him a program planned for raw. He's only scheduled to cut a promo. So he instead to just go home. Um, this is the first walkout, but I guess it doesn't feel like it's as big because it's just a promo and not a match. And it wasn't like a central thing on the show. They're doing something with Hogan, rock hall and Nash and Austin's just sort of there. So he's frustrated with that because he can feel that, Hey, I'm not priority with this company anymore. And he goes home when he, when he doesn't show up to the WrestleMania party and he goes home instead of going to raw. You gotta be in Vince's ear. Like, Hey, we got to fix this. I mean, even Meltzer would report that Vince is trying to call him all week to try to smooth it over and get in his good graces. But this is really maybe not the first hint that there's trouble, but a major red flag that, uh, oh, our top star is not happy. Yeah. And look, even top stars get their fucking feelings hurt. He's a human being. He cared so much. still does about wrestling, the, the, the true pro wrestling business, uh, it is hard to measure that it's hard to weigh that. Uh, but I think more than anything, he felt disrespected and he had been disrespected. Conrad, uh, Steve had been disrespected, uh, in previous times of his career in other companies, you know, he did, he just was eating potatoes every day and making, you know, hardly any money. When he was, went to Memphis, he had a run in the run prior in WC, uh, WCCW in Dallas. And that was a Von Eric territory. So if you weren't a Von Eric, you're another guy. And he felt like he was not being utilized there. Uh, you know, we brought him into WCW. That's where I got to know him real well. And, you know, we thought, you know, he was, I said it on TV back in that era. You know, this guy's a player. This guy's a big, going to be a big, big star. And nobody had ever said that on national television about Stone Cold. You know, and I, and I just felt like he was, he had everything. He's six, two, he's 245. He's athletic. He works nice and snug. He's got a great mind for the business, a great feel for what he does well and what he doesn't do well. So what I think at all, at the end of the day, bad communication led to stone cold. He said, well, he got his feathers ruffled. Okay. There's another word for that. It's called, uh, uh, disrespect and hurt feelings. So uh, being a human being and being a very emotional guy, uh, you know, I can tell you this when, when Jan got killed, Conrad and Steve was, I think the first guy to call me middle of the night, uh, cause she was in the hospital the first night, you know, and, and just on life support, uh, he had a hard time talking to me cause she meant that much to him too. We were friends, man. And you could tell he's, he's so sensitive in that respect. And I'll never forget that phone call. But I think at the end of the day, he just got his goddamn feelings hurt. And I can understand that I've had my feelings hurt there too. It's not fun. It's not poor about Jr. the show It's about stone cold or topic. But I think based, bottom line is he, he felt disrespected and he's not going to go back there anymore. He had the financial security or the monies he had earned that he didn't need to work another day in his life. 
because he always was a good money manager, always, still is. Uh, so I think that that was the deal. He just, and, and, and he mentioned he and Deborah didn't go to the party. You know, that's very unusual because uh, everybody went there and nothing else to drink for free and eat good food and hang around with your buddies and have a laugh and all this other stuff. Could celebrate us, uh, celebrate the event, celebrate WrestleMania. So it just uh, was a, it was a sad time. It was, it was, I was very conflicted. That was the p- hardest point in my career there, uh, as a, as a head of talent was that we allowed this to happen. And no matter how hard we tried, we allowed this to happen. And, uh, it's, it's a, it's not good management and I'll take as much blame as anybody in the roster. Anybody in the company, I should have been looking out better for him. I just never saw that coming. I couldn't imagine in my wildest dreams that the, we would not have something for stone cold. And, and we didn't, which was a damn embarrassment. So that's the day after WrestleMania, but the next week, uh, he's back on raw. This is when they're doing the brand split, but they're not still really sure what's going to make Steve happy. So they say in storyline, he has a clause in his contract where he can't be drafted and he can be a free agent and he can go wherever he wants. So Vince is still trying to cater to his top star a little bit, but he's having trouble finding exactly what's going to make Austin happy. Uh, he does show up on the, um, April 1st raw and he hits a stunner on both Vince McMahon and Ric Flair. Of course, these are the guys who are running the different brands and the whole thing is a huge success for the ratings. Uh, the first hour does a 4.45. The second hour does a 5.19, but the overrun with Steve Austin does a 5.72. So even though they don't really know what to do with him creatively, him being on the television is a channel changer. Everybody wants to go there. Everybody knows Steve Austin's here. Hey, turn it over to USA. What's happening. This is a big deal. Uh, when you can have that sort of power to uh, make so many eyeballs want to come to you. And it probably just further cements the way Steve feels that, Hey, we've made me a star. Now, what are we going to do with me? All right. The April, You're right. The April 21st, uh, backlash is in Kansas city and Austin loses to the undertaker in a number one contender match for the undisputed title on this very same card. Hulk Hogan would defeat triple H to become the undisputed champion. Um, that's been covered in some of the old judgment day, 2002 episodes on something to wrestle, but it's pretty remarkable when you think about it, that, and of course, Austin, I'm sure had no problem losing to the undertaker, No, but he's not exactly thrilled with the idea that these new guys are coming in. And now the new guy, Hulk Hogan is, is working with triple H and then becoming world champion. Um, well, well everybody knew that Hulk was not the, the old Hulk because of lingering ongoing back issues. So he was a little bit limited on what he could do physically. No knock on Hulk, just is this wear and tear, you know, uh, the other thing that's interesting to point out on the show that Austin came back and the overrun, uh, did such a great rating, uh, that show had approaching 7 million viewers. Now, based on today's numbers, Oh, it's huge. Well, my God, it's that's uh, you know, I think raw last week or here lately did like under 2 million and 1.7 or 1.8 or something like that rounded up to two. And, and this raw was three and a half times bigger than the more recent ones. I mean, it's there unbelievable. You, go. It's, you know, it's hard to debate Austin's logic and I didn't debate it. I don't think Vince really debated it as well. Uh, but, and I don't, and I maybe Vince sensed that Steve was, was, uh, cooling down a little bit and he wanted to stay ahead of the curve, but the issue Steve was cooling down was because we didn't have viable opponents for him to fight. I'm glad you mentioned that because that sticks out like a sore thumb. When you fast forward to may and you see the judgment day pay-per-view in Nashville, 14,000 fans there at Bridgestone, Austin's going to beat big show and Ric Flair in a handicap match. And he would write, well, that program is dead now better than you'd think. Uh, thanks to flair and Austin two and three quarter stars. So they don't know what to do with him. So, Hey, we know he loves Ric Flair. We'll put Ric Flair team in with a giant and let them beat them both. But the next day on raw, it feels like they're trying to find a new opponent for him. Things are moving very quickly, of course, but Austin and Deborah are in a bar here on raw and someone buys a beer for Deborah. This pisses off Austin, but it turns out it's Eddie and Austin's going to start a feud with Eddie, but Flair and Austin are still involved. 
And now Chris Benoit is becoming part of the angle, but he's had enough. He's not happy to the point that he does a now famous bite this interview. This is uh, sort of before podcasting was the thing. There was an audio show that had a video element over on WWF.com. And it's at the end of May, just a week or so after judgment day. And the highlights are quote, bottom line is everything sucks. I'm not happy with the direction going for stone cold, Steve Austin. I think it's piss poor. The writing sucks. It can be a hell of a lot more creative. And then he talks about the rumors of him being unhappy saying that's true, but that was brewing even before WrestleMania. He thinks the roster split is a horrible idea. He thinks the brand extension has sucked so far, but the only good thing is it's allowed him to spend more time with Deborah. And he it, it's brought up about Brock Lesnar, who is now branded on raw as being the next big thing. Cause he debuts right after WrestleMania and he addresses this new upstart who's brought to the main roster as saying he's a blue chipper, but that this next big thing gimmick is pretty damn lame. So he's just upset with all of it. Um, the following week they have Vince McMahon on by this and he has to sort of defend the creative. And he says something along the lines of, well, you know, Steve's been cranking out platinum and now that he's cranking out gold, he's not happy or something like that. With the idea mm. being that Austin won't settle for anything less than being the absolute best, the absolute top of the heap. And that's probably a fair assessment. And I think is really as nice and maybe political as you can be from a Vince McMahon standpoint of saying, Hey, I'm trying to make my top guy happy. I just don't fucking know how to do it. Yeah, I think you're right. Steve's complex guy in some ways, but in some ways he's very, very easy to figure out. And uh, it all starts with communication. You know, any, any wrestler will tell you that when they don't hear from the office and the in, look hearing from the office, wouldn't hear from Jr. Cause he heard from me all the time. Right. But hearing from the old man, uh, and Vince had a plate full, you know, we were, I think that's about the time the it was the XFL. It was about the XFL time. And I believe 2001 and, uh, yeah, 2001 was XFL, but it, 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 there's clearly been a lot of moving parts. I mean, we should mention somewhere along the way here, the company's even going to change names from WWF to WWE. So to say that Vince doesn't have a lot going on I mean, he's only been public for a few years. He's trying the XFL. He's trying lots of things, but the gist is it feels like a lot of the mojo died when the competition died. So Vince thinks, well, Hey, I can reverse engineer that I'll do a brand split. So I know that Austin probably feels picked on in this era, but there's so many moving parts where for whatever reason, enough has changed. And it just feels like some of the quote unquote magic is gone from WWE here. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, it was a magic was affected, no doubt. Uh, but again, it comes back to booking, right? The magic didn't have to fade. All the, all you needed to do was get a heel red hot. And if anybody in the world understood that concept, it should be Vince McMahon because what did he do when he had Hogan? He had a heel factory, right? And, Ho and Hogan always had guys that Hogan liked or would acquiesce to working with because Hogan wanted to protect his gimmick. The gimmick was laying the golden eggs. Well, and but, Hogan was, so that's how I look at that. And, and, but St St Steve was, uh, Steve compared himself a lot to Hogan in that regard about how he's treated uh, the heel factory issue and all those things. But WW, WWF did that for years. Look at how they booked Bruno forever. Bruno right. champion for nine years of one stretch. But hang on now, just to play devil's advocate. Let's at least talk about it. Austin's turning down opponents left and right. I mean, you just telling a sidebar story a minute ago is, Hey, we had him working with Mero and he said, I don't want to work with Mero. Once upon a time, allegedly they tried to book him with Jeff Jarrett. I don't want to work with Jarrett. They tried to put him with Hulk Hogan, the biggest star in the history of the business before him. I don't want to work with Hulk Hogan. Okay. We'll, we'll let you wrestle Scott Hall. I don't want to work with him I, on some level. If you're Vince McMahon, it's gotta be, well, goddamn, tell me who you want to work. And, right. and, and even in stone cold's book, he would acknowledge sometimes I would get to raw and they would hand me the script and I would say, Hey, this sucks. Come up with something better. And Austin would acknowledge that that's probably not a, the best way to do business. But at the same time, the way that that system works is, and Bruce has said this a lot on the podcast, what about this? Or what if we, and those, what about, and what ifs became other ideas that Austin just a lot of times didn't offer. So he wouldn't say. 
I don't want to work Scott Hall. Let me have Kevin Nash instead. He would just say, no, this sucks. I don't want to do it. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's fair to say. I think it's a, it comes back to the old burnout thing. You know, I was looking here at our notes, uh, leading into Austin's, uh, uh, day in Atlanta, you know, he, he worked the house show run. Uh, he worked with Eddie Guerrero. I booked that. Uh, he worked with flair. I booked that. He worked with Eddie again. He worked with flair again. And then not before Atlanta, uh, he worked with flair again. And so in a steel cage that last time, yeah, and, I mean, and, so you, you're trying to give him sort of old school stuff that he likes and nobody would say that Eddie Guerrero can't work. And we know how, what high esteem, you know, Austin has for Ric Flair. So it feels like on the house shows, we're able to make him happy, but that's because maybe that's under control of guys like you or Michael Hayes. Whereas there's a small army of people trying to come up with what's on TV, right? Yes. Absolutely. And I don't know. I think we're at a place in Steve's career there where we could have come up with, you know, I could have said, well, why don't let's do a program with Eddie and tell Lawson loves working with Eddie. Eddie's a great talent. Eddie will make everybody better that he works with. Steve could do the same thing. Obviously, why don't we do something with those guys? Well, you know, either Vince didn't like it. Or they didn't, or the creative staff didn't want to give me the, the opportunity to contribute in that regard. Cause it'll take some of their thunder away. It should be a team effort. And that's, but that's why I booked Steve the way I booked Steve. You can look back at all those shows, everybody he worked with were people that he felt confident that he could go out and do the same thing I said before, have the best match on the card. Uh, and that was his, his issue. He was, but I think the overriding of all that, I think he was just goddamn burnt out. Uh, issues at home issues with his health, you know, thinking I may have a year left. I may not have that left. I get, if I get the wrong bump, I'm screwed, which is a fact. All that started weighing very heavily on him. And, uh, so I think that I don't know that we could have found the right answer. And I don't know that Steve and even today could tell you what the right answer was, except he knew what he did not like. And I've talked to talent about this a lot of times in private, uh, him and, 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 scores of others. If you don't like what you're doing, then suggest something better. Just like Bruce said, we're open. We all got the same goal. We want to draw, make money. So that was, uh, that was where we were with that. So I don't know if there was any solution to this problem other than Steve setting down with Vince, uh, me, if you needed me, I've been in a lot of those meetings, uh, because that I made them both comfortable, which I take as a compliment and, uh, and, and just go take a sabbatical. You know, take, take time off. You've been in a territory a long time. Maybe it's time to, you'd go to another territory and freshen up and come back to the other, to this one. But that was not really the case, but he wasn't a financial jam. He was still making a, a, a tremendous money on his royalties. His, his merchandise was going to sell whether he was on TV every single Monday or not, quite frankly. So, uh, but I don't know that we had an answer. I don't think he had an answer. I think his answer was, I need time off. I need to clear my head recharge my batteries and come back refreshed with a different point of view. I think that's where we were. And nobody wanted to admit that our poor communication with our top star has led to this. Let's also mention, because I do think it's worth mentioning that this is a time when, uh, business is, is not maybe what it once was. So everybody always talks about, well, that raw in Atlanta where Austin walked out, there's only 8,000 people there. And I know that the most prior time or most recent time prior to this, they were there. It was the Royal rumble, but it sold out. You go back to the last time they were in Atlanta in 2001, they ran the Georgia dome and had 24,000. And then that August, right in the smack dab, the middle of Atlanta or the, the invasion angle, it sold out again. So business is definitely sort of, I don't know, trailing off a little bit. And a lot of that again is because of the creative and. I'm sure that's just getting right to Austin again. And he would write in his book, we were about to do a show in Columbus, Georgia, and we were going to drive up I 85 to Atlanta for raw the next night. And Deborah with whom I'd had a big damn argument was already in Atlanta waiting on me. And in his book, he would write, JR gave me a phone call and we talked about what creative wanted for Monday night. They wanted Brock Lesnar to slip over on me real quick. And I don't know where, when in an unadvertised match with no buildup or promotion or meaning in a tournament style deal. 
there would be a screw job and he'd catch me for a three count. And I thought that was complete crap. I told Jr. they're going to have to change that. I ain't doing it. And Jr. said, well, that's what Vince wants to do. And I said, if they don't change it, I ain't going to fucking be there to me. This wasn't business. I worked the house show that night, wrestling Ric Flair in a cage. And in the meantime, Vince called me and left a message on my hotel voicemail saying, Steve, this is Vince. Give me a call. No matter what time it is, give me a call. So we can talk about that creative for tomorrow's show. I checked out in Columbus and drove to Atlanta and made it a point of not calling Vince back until I got all checked in at my hotel room in Atlanta. My cell phone rang a few times in the car, but I didn't answer it. When I got to Atlanta, I checked in my room and I called Vince. It was probably two in the morning. And I said, Hey Vince, it's Steve. I'm just calling you back. And he runs the same scenario by me. Brock goes over with no buildup in a surprise situation, or just a tournament style match. He laid all that shit by me. And I sat there and listened and said, okay. Now Vince was thinking I'm saying, okay, because I'm agreeing to do it, but I'm saying, okay, I'm fucking fed up. This is bullshit. And then Austin explains in his book and he's explained a thousand times since that it wasn't losing to a young Brock Lesnar. That was the issue. It was more how it was done. He says, now had they wanted me to do a job for Brock with no, with zero buildup, I started seeing the writing on the wall. That's when I decided to walk right or wrong. It had nothing to do with the fact that it was Brock. It could have been a dozen other guys. I love Brock to death. He's a great kid and he's going to be a big superstar in this business, but I've drawn more money than anybody in the business. I've reportedly sold more merchandise than anybody in the business. And I've sold more pay-per-views than anybody in the business. So stone cold is not first in line to do a job for Brock Lesnar. And he would also write in his book. I'd already told Jr. I wasn't going to be there in Atlanta. I wasn't going to argue with Vince on the phone. And I wasn't going to show up the next day and try to hammer it out of TV. They had screwed with me to the nth degree. And as soon as I hung up the phone with Vince, I looked at Deborah and said, we're going home tomorrow. She said, no, no, no. And then I told her what they wanted me to do. So you're in the middle of this, you know, you're the one calling to give him the news. Um, how did that phone call go? Pretty much how he laid it out in his book. Yeah. He's honest as hell. It went exactly that way. You know, I, I try to defuse the situation enough to get the two decision makers, if you will, Vince and Steve together. And, uh, you know, Steve was just tired of fighting. He's, he's just tired of the consternation and, and the lack of respect in his eyes. And look, I'm not telling you everything that Steve said was, uh, was, was the way it was from the standpoint that, uh, he, 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 he assumed a lot of, he, he processed a lot of information that may have been, he could he might've been able to process it better in a different way. I think he would agree with that. Uh, but he was he, Conrad. He was fried. Yeah. He was done. And, and we could, we let him. We let him smolder and, and the, and the, the ashes are still hot as far as his passion was concerned. And, and again, there is no, there's, I don't have any magic. Well, if we had done this, everything would have been just fine. That's bullshit. We, there was no, this to do. You got a guy that has a lot of, a lot of, uh, things at play and personally, which in the wrestling business, you know, we don't, you know, I had a chance and, and one of my great pleasures in life is becoming great friends of stone cold. I knew his personal side. I knew he was having issues at home. I, I, I knew that his marriage was on, on Rocky ground. And of course it eventually, uh, dissolved, you know, th th the point he made in his book, the night before his, uh, his issue in Atlanta on Monday, Deborah wasn't even in Columbus. They had an argument and she went on to Atlanta. So that was an ongoing thing. Uh, and then again, I can't stress enough the health issue, you know, God damn, man, he, it's not just having it. Well, I might not be able to make all this big money and I can't be on top forever. He was dealing with an issue that if done incorrectly with somebody that he didn't feel comfortable with and, and confident with Conrad, he would, he would not be the same man that he is today. He wouldn't be up walking around. You know, that neck issue was a bad piece of business, not to, notwithstanding the fact he had two bad knees, which a lot of guys do. But the neck thing was a, when you can have paralysis uh, uh, and not know exactly what it's going to take to make that happen. You know, Dr. Youngblood is an amazing surgeon in San Antonio. He did the best he could on Steve, but Steve had that stenosis his, 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 the, his DNA, his, he, uh, hereditary, hereditarily, 
uh, had a small spinal column. And it was just, nobody could fix that. That's what he's born with. So that they, he did all, we did all we could for him and Steve did all he could for himself rehabbing and things. But again, I don't think none of us can understand, uh, how he felt like, uh, at that time because of what happens if, and I always managed this way. And I tell him this, I managed with the worst case scenario in mind. That's a smart management in pro wrestling. And Steve, you have to, the issue is, is that, you know, better than anybody that this is a very delicate situation. And that's why Conrad, a lot of guys that Steve worked with, he knew could help, could protect him as we're supposed to, that's sort of the goal of every match, protect your opponent, you know, take liberties. And he wanted to work with the guys that he thought were either fundamentally sound, enough experience, or that he trusted trust is a big thing. And I think that's why he was so particular about some of the guys he worked with, notwithstanding only the creative that's there too. But if he didn't have total confidence that you're going to take care of him, protect him as a pro wrestler should in every match, uh, he had, he, he was very uncomfortable as we saw. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned all the other stuff he would write in his book. Uh, this stuff, what I thought were stupid, creative decisions set me off. It was the fuse that lit the dynamite. But the fact is I had a lot of other problems going on at the same time. My health had been failing for the last six to eight months. My serious neck and back problems were getting worse. And so was the problem I had with the reflexes in my legs. Of course, I would never admit that any of that was happening. I kayfabed it. I didn't say a word about it, but these are ongoing problems. And I could tell my body had had enough. I couldn't perform the way I wanted to. And I was frustrated and I was scared. And in my mind, I was feeling less of a man than I wanted to be less of a man than I had been. And while I was going through all the frustrations of my health issues, I was also dealing with problems with my marriage to Deborah and problems with my kids moving to England. I was completely stressed out with so many things going on and the bullshit just kept piling up on me. Finally, I'd had enough. As far as I was concerned, it was a done deal. I was gone. Uh, and then he says, uh, on June 10th, 2002, I walked out on the greatest job I ever had, but the bottom line, I was just overwhelmed mostly by my health problems. You don't know how it feels to have these kinds of problems unless you're actually physically going through it. They just weigh you down and it changes your whole outlook. And he's acknowledged in years since that because he's got all these stresses and pressures at work of, and I'm sure some of this is something he's still trying to wrap his head around. He was the biggest, brightest star in the business. And he pushed for a change in his character that really changed his standing in the business and affected business overall. I mean, we've all acknowledged that Austin turning heel hurt the overall wrestling business, not just WWE and not just Steve Austin's income, but the entire wrestling business. And you couple that with the fact that now Vince doesn't have the same creative competition he had when there was an ECW and a WCW. And now it's just him and he's trying to find his next hit. And he looks to guys that maybe Austin doesn't want to do business with. So Austin's going to be annoyed with that. He also had the injury with Booker T. Uh, he got married to Deborah. Perhaps that was not the best decision in hindsight. They're not going to be getting along here. They've got some issues there, now there's, you know, kids moving to England. He acknowledges he's hurting. So he's probably taking more pills than he might normally to help subside the pain. And he acknowledges that he's probably drinking more than he should. So you just add all of that together and it's a real pressure cooker where something's got to give and the path of least resistance may be just saying, man, fuck this. I'll come back when this is the place I want it to be. And he walks out. I mean, this is uh, a recipe for disaster. And really I'm glad that walking out is all that happened because we've heard a lot of guys when they get in these sort of pressure cooker situations. They do drink too much and maybe they get behind the wheel of a car and bad things happen. And thankfully mm -hmm. that didn't happen here, but this is, uh, not a good scenario in any era. No, it's not. And again, what would be the answer? How could we address, uh, his separation anxiety when his two daughters are going to leave the country? Sure. I mean, as, as, and I, there, I know there's a lot of parents or, or people that have siblings or or whatever, listen to us, uh, people have kids and have, or have siblings. How would you feel if they, your two, two, your offspring were going to move out of co the country? It's just, hell, I don't know how I would react. I mean, I would be depressed as hell because I would take the responsibility as Steve did, that it was my fault. The second thing with Deborah, 
who I think the world of. She was never an issue for us. Uh, and, uh, you know, always professional, uh, you know, she, she got in the business accidentally because she was married to Steve McMichael and the fact that she was a very beautiful woman who had a, a, a vent for, uh, for, uh, uh, entertainment. She'd gone to the Lee Strasberg school of acting. You know, she's, I think Mrs. Mrs. Illinois or something at one time, uh, obviously people remember she's a beautiful woman, still is a beautiful woman with a master's degree from the. From Roll Tide, University of Alabama, in, in, in criminal justice, I think. So she was uh, she was fine. So I think, and, and I can just tell you from my marital experience, excluding Jan, that I, I take a lot, as I said earlier, I take a lot of blame for my failed marriages. I had guilt. I had I had a lot of guilt uh, for years because you know I had a I had a daughter by each wife, and so that all, all, always saw a causes some issues. It's not a normal scenario, maybe more normal now than it was back in that era. But you know, I, I took that on the chin. I was, that was me. I screwed this up. You screwed up the family and it's your fault. Jr. It's your fault. And so I think Steve had the same theories, Conrad kids, leaving health, failing marriage, dissolving creative at work. And so where we're making the creative at work, the issue here, and it was an issue. There's no doubt, as Steve wrote in his book, it's no doubt it was an issue. However, it wasn't the biggest issue, in my opinion, and it certainly sure as hell wasn't, I can safely say, the only issue. We should mention that uh, things get worse because you guys have a new television show that airs on the weekend called Confidential. And you and uh, Vince McMahon take turns taking shots at Steve Austin mm -hmm. and you've been honest on the show before and in your book saying that you regret some of the things you said, but the thing that they sort of led the show off with is you comparing Steve Austin to John Wayne and saying it would be like John Wayne becoming a coward. You never see it coming. And I didn't see this coming and you regret that. Mm -hmm. Talk to me I about the confidential shoot, whose idea it was, how it came to be, what you thought of the final product and when you began to regret what was said here. I don't think I had many appearances on the confidential, to be honest with you, uh, over the years or how long the damn thing aired. It wasn't real long. Uh, I was instructed to be at the studio at uh, 120 Hamilton in Stanford by the chairman of the board. We're going to, we're going to do a piece on Steve Jr. And I, and I, and I need for you to be on it. And so but basically, uh, I followed quote unquote, the company line, uh, regrettably and, and certainly, uh, Uber regrettably in hindsight. Uh, and I tried to, you know, I tried to, to do the best I could in a, in a situation that was just, you couldn't accomplish good. It was a matter of Vince was pissed. And he was, I think his feelings were hurt. It comes back to this. Steve should have communicated with Vince better and Vince should have communicated with Steve better. And I did all I could, all I physically, emotionally, and mentally could to get those guys together. I'm we, we've had, I had, I had, I had meetings with them before where I orchestrated a meeting. I remember we had one in Houston. I think it was Houston. And the whole deal was, well, we're going to, I said, you guys need to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And, uh, and so then Vince said, well, I need you there. And then Steve, then of course I had a separate conversation. Steve said, well, I want you to be there. And I said, I'm not going to be there for either one of you fuckers. Uh, because you, you, neither one will be totally honest with another person in a room. That was Vince's MO. Right. Me and Vince and I together, we had the greatest arguments and debates and laugh and you know, whatever. Uh, and, and it was wonderful, but you put another person in a room. It changes the dynamic immensely. He's got to protect his image. And Steve's same way, you know, I've had conversations with Steve that would, it would put, lift the hairs on the back of your neck because we would argue about things, but at the end of the argument, we, we were fine because we got a, we came to a conclusion and bottom line Conrad is that we communicated. So I remember, like I said, that one meeting where I said, I'm not going to the meeting. You guys have got to get together. You'll be more honest. And said, well, that makes a little sense. Yeah, it does. It makes a lot of sense. I didn't say that, but. It did make a lot of sense. And they worked out whatever their issues were on that particular time. He was a special breed of cat, man. 
And with that special breed of cat comes the greatest box office sensation in pro wrestling history. For the time that he was on top, no matter what, he drew more money, so more merch. As, as he pointed out, he's right. I mean, I I remember him. Hey, he had a he had a million dollar downside after after he'd been there a few years. That was the highest number we could pay. We paid anybody. It was a million dollars a year downside. And that I remember one year on that one million dollar downside, he made thirteen million. So that he blew away his downside, obviously. Hello, and so it's just. It was just, a. I just don't know how we could have let it get so in such a bad shape, but, uh, but it did. And, and I still regret that I, I did all I could do. I did all I could do until I realized these issues are not just creative, right? Okay. Now we got a new, there's a new light shining here on this, on this problem. You even and, address that in confidential a little bit. I mean, you don't say it explicitly, but you say, listen, people are going to write about this and, and they're going to say it's because he didn't want to do this or that. Uh, but there's more to it than that. And, and people are going to want to dig into the why, and I'm sure they will, because our fans want to know what's going on. And and when you're done with this interview, uh, and, and you're very clear to, to point out, Hey, I'm not Jr. I'm Jim Ross. I'm not wearing the black hat. I'm just talking to you about me and my friend, Steve Williams. And so you're, you're very, this is not the, the raw is war Monday night version of Jr. And you would even write in your book, that was not a good day at the office. I wiped tears from my face on my drive home. Those were some personally challenging times. I hope I don't ever have to experience again. And in this piece on confidential Vince would say, you know, when someone won't sit down with you, when they won't meet with you, when they won't talk with you, they've screwed you. And uh, he's also going to say that Austin has effectively flushed his meaning Vince's investment down the toilet and, and you would double down and say, you know, he's saying, I'm not going to come to work. I'm going to turn my back on the people who took care of me. I'm going home because I'm not happy. And you're pus- you're pushing that you were the only person in the company invited to his wedding. You're his real life friend. And you think he needs to win as a team and lose as a team and he should have been here. And Vince then says that this is sad and he's done everything he can, but Austin walked away from the job like a child. And, um, Vince is sure to make sure to say I've been over more. I've been over backwards more for Steve Austin than anyone else. And he even says the door is not open for him to return because he doesn't feel like his investment is safe. When this comes off, it's shockwaves through the wrestling business. Of course, it's rare that the top star quote unquote takes his ball and goes home, which is certainly the picture that Vince would paint a few times. When you see the, the piece air, what do you think of the final product? I mean, you wrote in your book that you said a lot of stuff that didn't make air. Um, were you happy with the final product or did you immediately regret what you guys had put out there? I didn't like it. Because they left out a lot of things that I added that would have taken a lot more of the heat off Steve. All I did was tell the truth, but that didn't make air. So I didn't like it. Uh, I, Vince, uh, I don't know, man. It's like when I went to umpire school, major league umpire school in 1976, they said, uh, one of the great traits of being an umpire is you have to be, you have to remain unemotional in an emotional situations. Right. And, uh, I think Vince was very much, uh, emotionally invested in Steve. I think all the time he was saying he's not welcome back. That was bullshit. You know, obviously it was, uh, you know, Steve had done so much for the company. Uh, you can look at a lot of reasons that the, the WWE went public and became this conglomerate that they are today. But one of the catalysts was the success of stone cold, Steve Austin and the TV ratings that he helped garner. And the, uh, revenues that we created at the live events, which has never been duplicated since. Uh, and certainly in, you know, of course, in the virus era, there's no live events, uh, <clears throat> non-televised events. Uh, so I think Vince is, you know, this you, you, timely wise and news wise and entertainment wise, blah, blah, blah. You kind of got to strike while the iron's hot on the story, but, uh, you know, it might've been a better for. You know, maybe Vince had too much coffee that day, but he was very emotional and I know he wasn't pleased with everything I said, of course, the reason that I know is it didn't make air. 
but I tried to give Steve quote unquote an out. If that's a good wrestling term and basically to tell the whole story uh, that you and I've talked about here today, we've told the whole story or we're telling the whole story. So I didn't like it and I felt bad about it. And you know, I was very, I, just very reluctant to, I, I watched it one time in my life where well, you told me, I said, I couldn't, I couldn't acknowledge true or false. I not, I blocked it out. It was, it was a bad day. And, and uh, like I said, I only lived about 10 minutes from the, uh, from the studio and I lived in Norwalk off exit 13 and, uh, I went right down, uh, the, you know, the, when you get on the highway, I drove down the city streets going home every, every day through dairy and et cetera, et cetera. Shoot, man. I, I had, I just, the tears in my eyes because I failed. I failed as his friend. I failed as an administrator to intercept these issues and to intervene. But some, the, like I said, the, to intervene on, on, uh, like Steve and, and Scott at WrestleMania 18 and hell, I didn't know there we were going to do that until the week of the show. So you had to catch up, catch up. And then you got, you got no time to, to preface what they're doing or what, because they didn't know where they were going after that. That was the issue. They had no plan. It was just, well, let's do this. We'll do this for WrestleMania. And then we'll figure out something. That's kind of, I looked at it. So I didn't like the show Conrad at all. And I don't ever intend to watch it ever again. Let's talk about raw on June 17th. As if this wasn't bad enough, we somehow find a way to make it worse. Vince is going to open the show. This is just two days after confidential and he's going to address the stone cold, Steve Austin situation. He says, we have to move on tonight as a company without Austin. And this segment ends with Vince drinking a beer saying, thank you. And leaving the beer in the middle of the ring. We get through that. And then they start to tease that the man is on his way to the arena. And of course the tease of the man. Uh, turns out to be the rock and, uh, this is all on the network. Rock's going to give a big pep talk to the fans and reference the sacrifice and the guys in the locker room and how they bust their ass for the company. And then in a not very subtle manner says, if you don't want to be in the company, then just like the slogan says, you can get the F out. This is, uh, less than ideal. And it feels like Vince digging his heels in. And I don't know, man, for all the times we've heard that Vince is uh, a genius and I don't dispute that this feels like perhaps the worst possible idea to me. If you've got a problem with your top guy, I don't know that I would want to air the dirty laundry out on confidential. And I certainly wouldn't want to bring out one of his old professional rivals and have him just shit on him in front of every, I mean, that this is a bad idea. Is it not? Yeah, bad idea. No reason to get Rock implicated in that because I know, even to this day, Conrad, that Rock and Steve are buddies. They have great respect for each other. You know, I don't think they hang together or run together, especially in the virus years. But they uh, they have great respect for each other. Look, they had three WrestleMania main events. But they're also naturally competitive. I mean, when you I get... understand. I understand that, but rock's got too much class sure. to go out there and go into business for himself oh, of course, with, without being produced by Vince. And I think Vince is setting that beer in there and thank you was only to set up the thought that maybe Steve's coming back tonight. The man is coming back because in the vernacular of the wrestling fans in that era, there was only one, the man. Yeah. And that was stone cold. In numerous interviews, Austin has referred over the years, how Vince would leave him voicemails all the time and he wouldn't return them. And this goes through, you know, not just June, but July and August. Um, and there's a pretty well-known story. Austin even wrote about it in his book. He wrote, I got a card in the mail from Jr. He sent me a nice handwritten note that said, I'm here. If you need anything, don't hesitate to call me Jr." And that's when I picked up the phone and called Jim Ross. And we must've talked for two hours because I know I went through two cell phones. <laughs> we talked for two straight hours about what was going on, where my life was. And finally he said, is there any way you'd want to meet up with Vince and talk about how things got all screwed up at the end? I know that's not how you would have wanted to finish up. And I said, yeah, I'd love to talk to him and find out why everything happened like it did. And he can ask me the same thing. And Jr. says, I'll talk to him, see if I can set it up. I'll call you later. So we set up the meeting. And then of course, in the meantime, we've got SummerSlam and, um, the meeting happens. I think when 
the, the show comes through Houston, which would have been late September, probably September 30th. And it's set up in a hotel room. I think it's a penthouse in the Weston hotel. Uh, are you in the room when this meeting happens? No, that's the one I've, I, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't I, cause it, they wouldn't have been the same, right? You know, they they would have been almost in performance mode for you and I would be, the, and I'd be the audience of one. It would have been nice for my resume to say, well, yeah, I was the guy that that brokered the peace between Austin and, and uh, McMahon and the uh, pat break my arms monsoon would say patting myself on the back. Uh, but that's not how it was. I took myself out of it to accomplish what we needed to accomplish in that meeting. It had been a long time since those guys were, were face to face. And I'm telling you something, both emotional guys, Vince and, and, and Steve, that you, do you think they want to see me be there to see them cry? You think they want to see me there to see them get emotional? Will they, will they be as open and as free, free flowing and as honest with each other? If another person's in the room, especially me, no, they wouldn't have both for the betterment of the company and, and McMahon and Austin, uh, I, I needed to be, I was there in a the hotel, you know, I, I got all arranged. I did the thing and I, and I saw Vince all that before the meeting and after I saw Steve before the meeting and after. I just wasn't in the room, but I, I did orchestrate that meeting and it was in a suite at the Hyatt. I think, you, I think you said Hyatt. Uh, and so, and, and I think they cleared a lot of air in that meeting. I don't think they solved every issue. Everybody left and, uh, you know, uh, with a you know, happy go lucky skipping out of the room, but I think they cleared the air a lot and both guys did what they needed to be doing, uh, months prior. They fucking communicated like two grown men. And that's what the goal was to set that meeting up in the beginning. I did a lot of, I, I was very lucky Conrad in that job. And I did, I, I think I did a lot of good things for WWE. I really did. And I could have done a lot of things better. I want to, want to, want to say that, but, uh, that may have been one of the more pivotal things that I've done in my career there was getting Austin and McMahon back together to at least communicate eye to eye, man to man, no fucking phone messages, no sales, OMG, LOL, fuck that shit. Don't text me. If you need to talk to me, pick up the goddamn phone, hit the rubber button and call me. Let's talk like human beings and today's generation. Hell, that's, that's unacceptable. Again, I, I got a, I got a text. So, uh, that's, uh, I'm proud of that moment. And it was a, it was a pivotal day in the history of WWE. Let me tell you, it was a big day. Uh, Austin opens up the conversation with Vince by saying what happened. Uh, and then once Vince explains and says his piece, Austin writes in his book. And that's when I opened up to him about all my frustrations about what they wanted to do with my character and how it was bullshit, but it didn't clue him in on what was going on with my health, but it ends well. Uh, Austin asked the company to help him do some, uh, promotional work for some of his personal appearances. Vince of course agrees. And then they start talking about, you know, how they could move forward. And eventually we know he comes back in 2003 and, uh, they've even discussed it on Austin's podcast that Vince said, I have to find you. And he wanted to find him $650,000. Austin counters for a $250,000 fine and Vince accepts it. So this walking out on the job costs Austin no less than a quarter million. And I'm sure some of our listeners would say, well, no, you just said it was 250, but without the promotional vehicle behind him for all of, and him being on TV every week, I'm sure his merchandise and royalty checks dipped a little bit and he's not getting some of the big pay-per-view payoffs, et cetera, et cetera. But still a $250,000 tax on top of the lost income pretty substantial. Yeah. And, and that was a great, and don't think that that message didn't get out to the boys. Of course. You know, that was part of the, part of the issue is that you could not allow the president precedent to happen. Uh, make this a precedent where a top guy or any guy can walk out because here's the deal. If a guy, if a below of undercard guy had walked out or somebody that wasn't pivotal to the success at that moment of the company would have fired their ass. You're gone. And you breached your contract. That means you don't get your royalties anymore. So breaching is a, so Steve keeping paying the fine. Hey, don't, he, he got his, that's a big hit, man. That's a lot of money, Yeah. but he got, he, he had a chance to, to, to make it back 
and to start fresh. But the other thing it did, as I was about to say, is that Vince, uh, that was conveyed to the locker room. He didn't walk away. He didn't walk out with no, no penalty. And I think that was, uh, I think that was a, a great message. I think that's the same theory that Vince had way beyond my vision of why he didn't clue me in on the Montreal screw job. He said, you can't, I can't allow you to lose confidence, the, the locker room to lose confidence in you, or they think you were in collusion with me on this decision I made about uh, Sean and Brett in Montreal. I didn't like it at the time, yeah, but over the years, uh, I have understood it and I respect Vince for doing it that way and protecting me. So I think what he did is protect the locker room and dissuade others from having a like, uh, <laughs> mindset about, well, fuck Austin walked out. I want you to walk out too. Well, now here's the consequences there. There's consequences of breaching your contract and the old WWE contracts. And I'm relatively certain, uh, that even today, if you breach, you forfeit all your royalties. If you do not breach and you fulfill all your commitments, those ro- I still get royalties from WWE because I didn't breach on contract. I fulfilled all my obligations. Obviously it's not a lot of money because I'm not, you know, the video stuff here, there and yon. But the bottom line is I get beer money out of it, but nothing else. And because I kept my commitment. So that was the deal there. You don't want to breach a contract there and then lose your royalties forever, forever. Cause you walked out, you breached your deal. So, uh, it was, a that $650,000 deal. I, I had to kind of raise my eyebrows on that one. I was like, Whoa, hell, what just find a million. <laughs> so, and here's the thing about that is the 250 K came out of future earnings. So I don't think Steve had to go write a check for it. He no, just no. didn't get his, he just didn't get the money that he earned. Well, as we know, uh, February 10th, 2003 Staples center, Los Angeles for raw Austin makes a surprise return. Uh, and, and we're thankful to know that, uh, this story has a happy ending. He's still a part of the WWE family and pops up and does stuff for him from time to time on the network. And whenever there's a big reunion, you know, he's going to be out there with a live mic and doing what he does. And that's entertaining the fans. We took to Twitter though, and wanted you guys to pick Jr's brain. We said on an upcoming grilling Jr. We're discussing when stone cold walked out on the WWF. Do you have a question for Jr? Drop them in the comments and use the hashtag ask Jr. And if you've got a question for next week's episode, which is clash of the champions 11, which we'll get to in a little bit, just follow us at Jr. grilling. That's the official show account where you can ask questions for Jim. It's at Jr. grilling. One of the first questions I thought was a joke at first, Jim, but then I started to really think about it and maybe it's worth exploring a little bit. Let me finish the thought before you shit all over it. Cause I know that's what you're going to do. Ray wrote, were there any rumblings that triple H was sort of behind some of Austin's booking to be correct? I don't believe triple H was responsible. So he's sort of asking tongue in cheek. And at first I sort of laughed and thought, boy, people just hate triple H for no reason. But then I started to really think. Well, it is worth mentioning China leaves the company in 2001 around that same time as when uh, triple H goes down with a big injury. He comes back for the big renewed push in 2002 wins the rumble main events, uh, the WrestleMania spot that Austin rightfully felt was his. And then the very next month he loses that world title to Hulk Hogan. So it does feel like Vince may be going with triple H perhaps did move Austin from a spot that he felt was his own. And we would be remiss if we didn't at least address that in this era, triple H is now the, uh, new quote unquote favorite son because he's dating Stephanie and Stephanie is a power player backstage in this era too. Was there any sort of, as far as you know, um, different emotion from Austin about the way triple H was being pushed and him feeling like perhaps that was his spot. Well, I think a lot of the guys felt uh, there, there's a similar, uh, philosophy or feeling that triple H is taking advantage of his dating the boss's daughter, uh, as the reason that he was getting a, a great push push. God damn it. Conrad, you know how many people I signed books for. That want me to put on there something about a push. Sure, everybody. We even made push famous somehow, however. But nonetheless, uh, I I can't buy into that. I can't buy into the fact that uh, 
of the, no, I'm not, I'm buying in the fact he was dating the boss's daughter. Right. Uh, and you know, so, so be it. I used to tell Joni that Joni, I can't legislate who somebody dates. He doesn't want to be with you anymore. And then she'd car- start crying. Oh, uh, uh, uh. sound like Fred Gwynn on the Munsters. Uh, God bless her. She was so distraught. And another goddamn element to deal with is t- entitled relations. I just don't think he would do that. I think that he wanted to be the top guy, but if he didn't want to be the top guy, then something's wrong with triple H. If you know anybody on the roster, if you're not there to be the top guy, then why the fuck are you here? Are you going to be content with uh, your, your lot in life? Because that's where you perceive that this is as high as you can go. So I'm not going to work any harder. He worked very hard to get better. He was an excellent baby face. He's a better heel. And I think in today's climate where he's such an influential player in WWE, people look at that, take a different take. They, they take today's rules of being a power broker and they put it into, uh, yesterday's, uh, storyline. And I'm, I'm just telling you, he, he did not have the, even an iota of the stroke then that he obviously has, he had subsequently and especially today. So, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't go for that one. I don't, I, I know it's convenient and, and triple H is and Vince or can, you know, be, they're, they're very, they're very polarizing figures as we both know, but I don't think triple H would, would do that because I just don't believe that he's that kind of guy. I know he's a businessman. I know he's hard edged. He's learned that from Vince, uh, all power brokers, all head honchos in pro wrestling, uh, have been, have had have, that I've ever worked for in 40 plus years have been strong, strong handed every one of them. No different, every one of them. But to do to be that counterproductive for the company that's paying you great money, because Triple H was, I signed him to a million dollar deal, and sitting on an ambulance case. I told this story in Evansville, Indiana, of all places, and all he wanted to know was to make sure that he was getting the same deal as the other quote unquote top guys, and he and he did. I was honest, so I just I don't. It's a good question, but it, it's using today's criteria on yesterday's problem. I don't think it jives. Let's do a couple more questions here and then we'll wrap this one up. Um, Instagram, a wrestling historian writes, uh, when was the best time to book Austin versus Lesnar? And how would you have seen that match play out? Well, uh, uh one with a build up. First of all, I book it backwards. The match with uh, the first Austin Lesnar match in my point of view of booking would have been at WrestleMania. That would have been the debut match of Stone Cold and Brock Lesnar. Now, depending on how, how Lesnar's skill set had advanced, what, what year it was, uh, Austin's health, et cetera, et cetera. It's a great time. If you want to, if you want to pass the baton to, and, and make Lesnar the guy, then no better person to do that than the legendary Stone Cold Steve Austin, but no matter the finish. Uh, it, again, it depends on, okay, we're going to put the rocket on Lesnar or let's let Les, let's have Lesnar work with Austin, have a knockdown drag out, have Austin catch a stunner real quick, uh, you know, out of nowhere type deal where it's not a long drawn out baby face finish, but something is sudden and shocking and put Austin over and see where you, where you, how, how the big boy uh, from Minnesota swam in the deep water. That's another concept, which I think might've been the one that we'd have probably gone with. But if at that point in the, in the booking, in the storylines, book of the booking scenarios, everything, the future plans, if the plan was for Lesnar to become the top baby face or the top star in WWE, uh, then, uh, you know, I, I, you, you, you put, you put, you put Lesnar over, but if you weren't ready for that move, you just want to see how he's going to do with the best and how he's going to react to Austin calling the match, how the match is laid out, et cetera, et cetera then, uh, you put Austin over. So I, I it could go either way. And, and, bo- and there's both ways are right. Depends on where you are storyline wise and so forth. But without question, the, fir- the, they don't wrestle. They may fight. They may have a brawl. They may have a pull apart. They may have some other things, uh, vignettes and so forth, training vignettes. And it's a great shit could have been produced there, but it, it would have to be at WrestleMania without, without a doubt. Hey, they could have, they could have both eliminated each other at a Royal rumble going in type thing or something. There's a lot of ways to skin the cat, but, uh, that's kind of my, my thought on it. 
WrestleMania had to be the destination for the first one. Uh, a couple more quick questions. Um, Jack wants to know what was the mood around the locker room when stone cold walked out? Did any other talent take great offense? I think people were more surprised than anything else because he's, you know, he was a top earner and he's making all this money. And that's kind of where everybody gets in the business for to make more money. Uh, I think there were probably some that were relieved because he wasn't there and it gave them a, a more open door to walk through and to become a top guy or the top guy, whatever it may be, give them an opportunity. So when somebody, when one door shuts, another door opens. And I think that's kind of the philosophy I use for the guys. Hey, he's not here. Don't know if he's ever coming back because at that time it didn't, I was always honest with the talent, but he's not here. You're here. It's your turn. And now is the time for you to maximize your minutes. That's kind of my, that was my patent patent, uh, or pat deal. That's my pat answer. Cause I thought it was true. And, uh, and, and a lot of, but here's the deal. Steve was very well liked in the locker room because the top guy it's like the old days when you're when WWE would run three shows and you know, three house shows and you always looked at the booking sheet. You didn't care about where you, you just wanted to look where Hogan was. Then you wanted to find your name on that card. Cause that was going to draw. And Austin was the guy that was making, helping make a lot of people, make a lot of people money, big money. So, uh, and I got to ask every, you know, there wasn't a day, there wasn't a TV Conrad that went by that somebody didn't say, if you talk to Steve, you know, how, how Steve doing? Cause they knew I would be the guy that would be communicating with him. And so that was, uh, I thought that little note I sent him that you talked about handwritten, it was sincere. I didn't want to bother him with another phone call. I didn't want to, I'm tired of phone calls. I'm tired of the fucking text. I'm tired of all this shit to communicate communication shit. I wrote him an old school letter card. It was a card that you read the whole thing. He put it in his book. It meant a lot to him. It, it, and we got that meeting in Houston because of it. I can promise you. So a lot of guys missed him. He was funny. He was motivational. He, they, he led by example in that regard on the good days that we had with him. So many more good ones than bad ones. So, uh, he was missed. He was missed, but it did create opportunity. And that was all I had to build on Con. You got to find some positive in this massive negative that you could hang your hat on. So that was, the, that was the reasoning for that. I, I, how, how that worked, but he was, he was very well liked in the locker room and I think guys missed having him around. And, you know, notwithstanding the fact that he sold tickets and they got money off those tickets. Bad money. Slim writes. When you finally get through to Steve's cell phone that day, when he's in Atlanta, you said he was boarding the plane with his wife. And you also said you did most of the talking. What did the talking sound like from his end? Oh, he was, he wasn't himself. He was despondent, then angry, very emotional, depressed, you know, uh, stressed out. And, uh, you know, it was not a happy time. Those are the kind of calls you hate to make as, in that role. And, but you know, it was my job and he was my friend. And I, I just wanted to know that I would, I'm not going to turn my back on you. No matter what you do, uh, I'm not going to, I'm, you're my friend. You have, you're, we're different. We're not in our, we're not in uniform. I'm not in my hat. You're not in your tights. You know, I can look right now in my trophy case in my living room and he gave me his boots that he wore beating Shawn Michaels for his first title. And that's pretty damn cool. I don't know what that'd be worth. You'd like to have them in your collection. I can guarantee you. Yes, sir. You know, uh, so, so we were we were very close. We were, we had a great bond because, uh, just the nature of the beast. It allowed us to, we finally broke that trust thing where it's the office, the office. So, uh, but I, I, it was just, it was a tough conversation and, uh, I just did, I did the best I could to get him to, to come to TV, talk this thing out. I, I finally got it accomplished after the note we talked about and in, in, in Houston, I couldn't get it done that day. And I felt like I let my friend down. I think I let the company down cause I couldn't convince him to come and, you know, uh, and talk. He felt embarrassed that it had come to this. And I don't think this is, this is me talking. I don't think he really wanted to face the boys because I think he felt like it was, you know, he was, it was a tough hand for them to be dealt to the top guy that's helping draw money and is helping feed your families and, and all this stuff, uh, with his productivity and he's letting them down too. 
but uh, I think that's one of the reasons he didn't come to the to the Atlanta that day. He was he was, he was, didn't want to deal with it anymore. He didn't want to see the face of the guys because it's hard to explain to somebody when you're making millions of dollars a year and he was why you're leaving. And I don't think he wanted to share with everybody that hey look my kids are moving to England my goddamn neck's killing me my back is screwed up you know my marriage is what it is. You know, I don't think you want to go through all that stuff, stuff that we talked about here today and stuff that he was aware. I, I was aware of, but I don't think you want to share that with the boys at that point in time. So, cause I can just tell you about when he came back, Conrad, uh, uh, and a pretty good pop, by the way, Yeah. uh, <laughs> they love the fans, love him. They still love him that, uh, I think he was ready then to share. He was ready then to communicate. And be the, the, the basically the same old Steve that we knew in happier days. So, uh, but it was a tough conversation to say the least. But you got to make those conversations in your lifetime. I could have bullshitted with him. I could have texted him. But that's not, not my style, especially with him. Chuck Longley has an interesting question. He says Sean Michaels always catches hell for walking out. Why does it seem like Stone Cold gets a pass with most casual fans? Hmm. Well, Shawn Michaels walked out and made $750,000 a year. The entire time he was gone. Poor me. I'll take that. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. I, I think people just can't, most people that have never approached that kind of income or a comfort level of money, uh, don't understand how somebody can walk away from just simply the money. Steve had made a lot of money. He'd saved a lot of money. Again, as I mentioned, he was. I don't want to say he was thrifty, but he was thrifty. He was smart with his cash. He bought real estate. He did things that were smart. He, you know, it wasn't a Rolex of the week or a, you know, a hot car of the week. Hell, he's happy driving a, a goddamn classic Ford Bronco. You don't give a shit. That's fine with him. So I think just because he was the guy and people could not relate or under, or understand how the guy make it. I can't, let's say this. Would you walk out if you're making, you know, eight, Ten million dollars a year. Oh hell no! I never walk out. God, are you kidding me? That's great money. But he already had the money. Right. It wasn't about the. It wasn't about the money anymore. This is about real life at this point. Real life, buddy. Real life, and 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 some fans can't understand that. And maybe this show here will help them understand it better. But you know, we took good care. Sean was taken good care of while he was gone, because he was he was. We knew that once he got his self his head right, and kind of re, 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 hit, hit the reset button that he's still going to be one of the best workers of all time when we got him back. And, he, and when he, as we all remember the, when Sean Michaels walked right back into the picture, it seemed to me like he was as good, if not better than he was when he left. That's just my take on it, but I'm a, but I'm a Sean Michaels fan. And I'm also the guy who went to San Antonio to talk to him about that situation. You can't leave this. Like you can't leave your legacy like this. Right. And he bought it he, and he, and he understood. He and his guy, Skip McCormick, were, they understood. I said, take your time, but know that we want you back and know that I would like to have you back to talk to young talents and be in the locker room and be, have a presence, uh, around the guys. Cause you're the good, much like a generation, uh, grew up idolizing the Nate. There was another generation that grew up idolizing Shawn Michaels. He was influential. So, uh, that, you know, I, I think, uh, it's a, it's an unfair, it's a good question, but I don't know that it's a, it's a real fair question based on uh, that, you know, tri that, uh, Sean got away with this or, or Steve or Sean didn't get away with it or whatever. Yeah, this is, they're both of this, a lot of the same issues, marriage issues, health issues, the, the professional mortality issues affects artists, performers in a different way. How many times have we read about a great NFL player that's just going to hang over that one more season, one more year, and because uh, they don't want to give it up, this is their life, and so I, I, it's a good question, but I, I don't, I don't think it's a fair question. The question is fair, but the, the perception is probably not accurate or fair. Well, we hope that we can be fair next week when we talk about Clash of the Champions Eleven Coastal Crush. It went down on June thirteenth, nineteen ninety. So we're just about 30 years away from that. The main event is Ric Flair defending the NWA world heavyweight championship against the junkyard dog. We've also got the, uh, 
We'll talk about it next week, but we got Paul Orndorff and Arn Anderson in singles action, an incredible tag match with the tag titles between doom and the Steiner brothers. We've got Lex Luger working with Sid vicious, Barry Windham with Doug Furness, the rock and roll express versus the midnight express for the United States tag team titles. Uh, Mark Callis, who we know is going to go on to be the undertaker taking on Brian Pillman. We've got Tom Zink teaming up with Mike Rotunda to take on Fatu and the Samoan Savage. Tommy Rich working with Bam Bam Bigelow. Then in our opener, the Southern Boys taking on the fabulous Freebirds. Uh, Jim, I got to tell you, when you run through this, this is just one Hall of Famer after another. I'm looking forward to talking about this show next week. Yeah, me too, Conrad. A lot of guys were in their infancy uh, as far as their professional development was concerned. Uh, some guys you could see had greatness written all over them, just got to discover it and, and, and demonstrate it. Uh, really interesting. Don't let the JYD who was well past his prime against flair, uh, influence whether you listen or not. It wasn't the greatest main event. It wasn't one of nature's finest moments because what do you do? You know, it was just, a, it was a tough booking it, and, but the card is like you said, it's dotted with greats. And so we'll talk about all those guys in that era and how they were perceived, how they grew, uh, you know, how we managed them and all that stuff. So it should be a, it should be a fun, fun show next week. Uh, I, I always, I look back at those clashes with a great deal of fondness. They were some, some of my best work, I think was at the Clash of champions. To me, it was an honor to be a part of the, these live broadcasts. You know, Tony and I talked about that on one of our, uh, our ride along things, you know, the fact that, you know, he and I were the first broadcast team to do a clash. Two play by play guys. We're going to mesh all that good stuff. There's always a great backstory or two or 10, uh, on these class of champion shows. Well, and this one in particular is special because so many people look at that great American bash from 1990 and hold it in such high regard. Well, this is what is essentially the go home edition. Uh, I mean, this is happening on June 13th. That pay-per-view takes place just three weeks after this. So this is the last hurrah to build interest for the great American bash where we know sting is going to finally become world champion. Uh, but we're going to beat this one up next week. Looking forward to it. You can get this show and all shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. If you haven't already go check it out. It's only nine bucks a month to get started. Lots of different tiers after that, including a top guy spot, which is uh, going to be pretty special when we get everybody together here in Huntsville and spend some time have a few drinks and watch some more wrestling. And here's some stories that you might not normally hear on the podcast. Check out all the fun, including some bonus stuff over at adfreeshows.com. Until next week, he is at JR's BBQ. I am at Hey, Hey, it's Conrad, and we are out of time. We'll see you next week right here on Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Jim Ross. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at savewithconrad.com.